Good afternoon and welcome to the afternoon session of the Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing and public meeting of June 6, 2023. This meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. And if you wish to testify on any of the items we are reviewing this afternoon, please uh, feel free to join the webinar at the estimated time for that item, which can be found on our agenda, which can be found on our website. And please note that we are about an hour behind schedule at this point. So with that, I will turn it over to Corey Haralla to take us through the afternoon agenda items. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we'll begin today's uh, afternoon session of the Preservation Department with public hearing item number one, LPC 23-09433. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Borough of Queens Block 137, Lot 59, 4150 47th Street in the Sunnyside Gardens Historic District, a colonial revival style row house designed by Clarence Stein and Henry Wright and built in 1924. The application is to install skylights. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing and the staff will be taking you through the presentation. Uh, Tim, you now have control. Uh, please state your name for the record. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Sorry, um, I, uh, Timothy Shaw, preservation staff. Um, I think um, Laura Heim, the architect, was planning to do the presentation, but I understand that we're we're a bit in a time crunch, so I'll I think I can run through this. But um, she is here to uh, to help uh, answer any questions if needed. Um, 4150, 40 47th Street is on the west side of Forty Seventh Street. Um, in Sunnyside Gardens uh, Historic District, um, right at um, just north of 43rd Avenue. So the application is to install two uh, skylights through slate. Um, this is located at the rear of the roof. Um, seen here in the red square, um, the, the, the two skylights will be visible from a, a small portion of 43rd Avenue over the rear facade and over the neighboring building. Uh, this is the proposal in plan. Um, you can see here on the upper right, the um, two skylight openings, uh, the existing slate will be um, will be removed and retained for you know, potential further uh, future installation if necessary um, for any repairs. And um, that is, uh, it's a that's mostly it uh, the other work shown at the rear facade all would meet staff level approval as being approved under a separate review um not visible from the street so it's only this uh these skylights here is a rendering of that view um and there are existing skylights found at a number of other locations in the district um here in the map all the red outline or the red highlighted houses have these skylights were approved at Landmarks Commission by the Landmarks Commission and there are other existing skylights some even historic um, in through slate um, this is a approval from the same architect from last fall that was uh, approved on the upper right hand corner um, and then some other applications that that are existing throughout the district uh, as noted, um, the architect is here if, if you have any further questions about the specifics. Great. Thank you very much. The last slide. The last slide is the detail. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. And this is just showing the detail of, of, the, um, of the skylight that is to be installed. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. And commissioners, do we have any questions on this one? And Laura, is there anything you wanted to add at this time, or shall we, or shall we move to testimony and see if there are questions after that? I just want to briefly add that this is in the first of the courts in Sunnyside Gardens. It's the most eclectic. It faces onto an apartment building rather than a court, and it's only visible from outside the district. Great. Thank you very much for providing that context. Okay, let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and uh, wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We did not receive any signups beforehand and I am looking at our attendees list. I do not see any hands raised. I will give it one more moment before moving on. 
No, no hands raised. So I will just note for the record that Queens Community Board 2 recommends approval, and I'll bring it back to you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, Laura, if there's nothing else you'd like to say, I think we may be able to move to our discussion. And uh, that's fine. Okay, thanks. All right. And so let's go ahead and close the hearing. So, Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chu, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing <clears throat> is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And I um, want to thank you, Laura, for a very clear presentation. I think that allowed this to go as quickly as it did. And so I didn't mean to uh, rush through your item, but I think your materials are incredibly clear and helpful. So thank you for that. And so this is um, an application for these two skylights on the rear of the pitched roof. Um, that will be um, facing an apartment building and visible from outside of the district looking into the rear yard. And um, the applicant, Laura Heim, has presented other approvals the commission has made in this district for skylights as well as other pre-existing skylights. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Chen, would you like to start this one? Yes, be delighted to. Uh, this is uh, um, <clears throat> a very straightforward one um, and I, I can find it appropriate. Great, thank you. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, only visible from 43rd Street. I think it's appropriate. Thank you, Commissioner Ginsburg. Appropriate. Yeah. Commissioner Lutfi. Appropriate. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm muted. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Bland. Yes, it's appropriate. And I think I should say also that Velux is notable for having a very flat profile which I think also adds to the appropriateness of, of this selection. That's great to know, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Chu? Appropriate. Commissioner Master? Appropriate. All right, so I think we all are in agreement on this one and we'll go ahead and make the motion and uh, call the vote. Commissioner Chen, would you be comfortable making the motion? Problem. Um, in the matter of LPC 23-09433, 41-5047 Street, Sunnyside, Gardens Historic District. The application is to install skylights, <laughs> noting that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Sunnyside Gardens Historic District. I recommend approval finding the installation of the skylights on the rear slope of the roof will require only minimal removal of historic slate shingles, will, which will be salvaged and retained on site for possible future reuse, that the skylights will not be visible over the front facade of the building and will only be visible from a limited view corridor on 30, 43rd Avenue, that the installation will preserve the silhouette of the roof and relationship to other houses in the court, that there are other skylights installed in pitch roofs in the historic district. And this work reflects the adaptive reuse of the attic spaces of these very small houses over time, that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion Aye. passes. That's approved. Thank you. <clears throat> and we'll move to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number two. LPC 23-04530, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Queens, block 77, lot 47, 2126 45th Avenue in the Hunters Point Historic District. This is a neo greco style row house built in 1887. The application is to legalize the replacement of windows in non-compliance with certificate of appropriateness 19-31915. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing and the staff will be taking you through the presentation. Thank you, Abby. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Michelle Crarin, preservation staff. 
Um, as Corey mentioned, this application is to legalize work that was completed in non-compliance with LPC permits. Um, here you can see the subject property's location, which is on the south side of 45th Avenue between 21st and 23rd Streets in the Hunters Point Historic District. Um, this is a photo showing the front facade before the prior issue and pr sorry, prior to the issuance of the Certificate of Appropriateness 19-31915. At the time, the building had modern metal windows and panning. The approved scope of work at the time included replacing those windows with new wood triple glazed units featuring a fixed upper sash and a lower operable sash, simulating the appearance of double hung windows. Since early 2019, this type of window has been approvable at the staff level for the replacement of one over one double hung windows. However, at the time, this required commission level review. This slide shows the window dimensions as they were installed. The windows were manufactured with larger upper sashes and smaller lower sashes, including three foot tall upper sashes and two foot three inch tall lower sashes at the second floor, three foot three inch tall upper sashes and two foot seven inch tall lower sashes at the first floor, and finally two foot five inch tall upper sashes and one foot seven inch tall lower sashes at the basement level. And here you can see an existing conditions photo of the subject property, as well as the adjacent row houses. Um, and in addition, here are some additional context slides showing other buildings at the block, which feature several different styles and forms of row houses. And then um, lastly, here is just a close up showing the existing conditions at the windows. Um, and now I'll hand it over to the applicant who's here to explain the situation in a bit more detail and answer any of your questions. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is Anthony Tsarantanakis. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, a couple of things I want to say. The owners are long-term residents of the of the neighborhood. They've lived they lived a block away for over thirty years and then bought this property a few years ago with the intent of of, of restoring, <laughs> turning it into a passive house. Uh, they love this block. They want to live on the historic block in their neighborhood. Um, the, um, the we started the work in uh, late 2019, and uh, the when the when the pandemic hit, we the work stopped. So it was a long construction period. We waited a long time for the windows. So when the windows finally arrived, we installed them. And then this issue was brought to our attention. Uh, during the certificate of occupancy process. Um, the windows are as uh, the type of window and the manufacturer and the color were all the ones that had been specified. And um, the, the, um, the only difference was the, the height of the sashes and the dimension of the sashes. Um, in this slide, what we're trying to show is that the the uh, the sash the mid the midsection of the sash does have a certain alignment to the adjacent properties the the property it, it aligns the mid sash aligns reasonably well with the property on the uh, west side on the right of the photograph and um, and kind of less well with the property on the left which is actually built not in the same row even though it looks like they're contiguous in fact they're they're a different row and it's a slightly different elevation. Um, but the overall, the overall point that that um, that I want to make is that that I feel, and, and uh, Michelle, if you can go to the uh the next slide. Oops, sorry, I went back. That uh yeah, no, that the one there. you had up was not that one, no, the, the one with the overall street. Oh, okay, backwards. Yeah. Um I, I guess I want to make the point that the that the block itself has a lot of different kinds of windows and that the the ultimate result of the building um, does blend in with the overall sense of the block as a historic block on both sides of the street. Um, we did look into replacing the windows when this issue came up. It would cost because of the type of window, the nature of the installation, the fact that the house is occupied, it would, you know, we're estimating that it's going to cost around about $100,000 to do a replacement, uh, plus or minus. Um, and of course, um, result in a, in a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, 
discomfort for the for the owners uh, who who have put their heart and soul into this. Um, I think that's all I, I I need to say now. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? <laughs> Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, did you have a question or? Well, I, who who is at fault? There's nobody at fault, or what what happened? Well, the process that we are familiar with, called shop drawings and the process of construction. Who is at fault? Listen, it, it's it's um, the the contractor. Um, is not really um, is not really responding at this point. Um, okay. So there isn't there isn't really. Uh, I mean, we do have obviously other. The contractor is not offering relief. We have other means of you know engaging with the contractor if we choose that. Of course, that's a lengthy process. Um, no. You know, it was it it was you know to be honest, it was a situation where. After the pandemic, after a very long, <clears throat> hence construction process, the owners wanted to live in their house, and for for all to all, you know. Uh, I, I understand, and, and I simply you understand. I mean, I'm just you know. trying to understand the system and the structure. So, yeah. what what the issue is is really that the 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 heights of them vary. You submitted a drawing that shows certain heights, and when it arrived, the heights were different. Right? Is that? That's the issue, correct? That's right. The sashes, okay. the sashes, the glass area of the sashes is different than the approved drawing. The glass area of the sashes, the top sashes are approximately five to six inches taller than the bottom sashes. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I understand the system. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We received one sign up in advance for this item, so we'll be hearing from them first. Uh, that first sign up is Jeremy Woodoff from VSNY. So Jeremy Woodoff, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please state your name for the record and unmute your line, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Jeremy Woodoff speaking for the Victorian Society, New York. Energy conservation and passive houses are important, but historic preservation standards and architectural coherence must take precedence at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The windows as installed are incompatible with this historic Victorian house because of their noticeably non-centered meeting rails, excessively wide framing members, non-traditional details, and loss of glazed area. The application for legalization should be denied. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next step, we'll be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levy, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC can support the legalization of this window modification because replacing these units with the correct units would waste far more energy than the proposed passive house windows would save in energy consumption. Given that this legalization is necessary because the applicant was out of compliance with their own drawings, we hope this sort of error can be avoided in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I'm looking through the attendees list now. I do not see any further hands raised. So I will note for the record that Queens Community Board 2 recommends approval. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carol. All right, thank you very much. So I'd like to turn to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to comments we've heard in the testimony. Uh, no, I think I'm good. I think I stated my case in my presentation. Okay, thank you. And commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you all to unmute so we can begin our discussion. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? 
Central Market. Oops, Commissioner Jefferson. Wall Street? Oh, Wall Street. Oh, All right. Actually, Commissioner Lefty, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 My machine. <laughs> Thanks. Something happened to my machine. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, as was presented, this um, this is a passive house type window, which is a type of window that the commission routinely approves and in fact can approve at staff level now pursuant to rules that commission adopted in 2019. And um, so the, the issue and before us today is that the windows that were installed while they do have the, the variation in plane that we do require with the passive house type window, even though they don't operate like a double hung, they uh, the proportion of the upper sash and lower sash is not equal. And so that offset is one of the reasons it's for us today. The other reason is because of the uh, lack of brick mold and the flat framing. And you know we have in other cases where we have um, seen windows that have been installed in violation or in non-compliance without a profile, we have been able to solve that by adding a profile to the framing after the fact, which then um, helps to provide shadow line articulation and even uh, change the sort of feeling of the proportion of it. So that may be something we can consider here if you all find that that slight change in the configuration of the proportion, the asymmetrical proportion, uh, doesn't detract from the row. So we'll begin our discussion now. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you like to start this one? Uh, okay, uh, I, I'm torn. First, I wanna make the point that the unevenness of the windows has nothing to do with the fact that they're passive house windows. And I'm torn because clearly someone screwed up here. Uh, at the same time, I think the point the Historic District Council made that the amount of energy embodied carbon to replace the windows would be, would be significant. And so uh, I would say it's approvable. The one other comment I'd have is the green color seems somewhat out of place with the adjacent windows and either a darker gray, a darker green or a gray might be better. So I don't, I, again, I, it's not a strong opinion, but depending on how the other commissioners feel, I could see pushing that. And uh, I, don't, I haven't really seen the brick mold detail missing. So when I look at the photograph, so I don't find that a significant issue. Yeah, Carol, you're muted. Thank you very much. Commissioner Jefferson. Oh, thank you. I, I agree that um uh to, I I I agree that we should keep the windows. I, I wonder sometimes whether how how punitive one has to be, but I in this case I think the window should remain. I think the color though. Is 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 dominant and and perhaps it could be changed, but I don't know how. I don't I don't think you could feel paint the windows and have it hold up at all. I mean, it's just not much. It's not going to last more than two or three years. So I would keep the green and just accept this and say um, we made a mistake and I can approve it. And and that this the offset in the configuration doesn't detract from doesn't, the... doesn't doesn't bother the, the green is much more dominant and and if it was a gray or black you wouldn't see that much of it but i'm not sure how you do that technically without taking the windows out yeah. and i think uh corey i don't know if you want to and i know this is something we've asked people to do in the past yeah i mean i know it's not ideal in the factory finish you know is going to be the most durable, long lasting, but eventually like historic wood windows, they, they certainly can be repainted with quality products and, and that's okay too. So. Okay. All right. If that's the case, that's fine. Okay. Commissioner Lutfi. 
So um, I'm in agreement. The green calls too much attention to itself. I'm not even going to discuss the screw up here. <laughs> um, but I but I also think the the uh, recommendation to modify the brick mold is a good idea. Vice Chair Bland. If you're speaking, you're muted still. Yeah. Ah, sorry. More egregious to my eye is the green. Um, I'm sure that many people might notice the offset window sizes, but to me, um, that's not going to be a hugely egregious problem. But the green is a problem, I think, and should be painted uh, black or very dark gray. Um, I'm sort of neutral on the brick mold. Uh, but obviously, I don't think the window should be replaced. And I, I thank the HDC for <laughs> giving us um, a, a, a good reason to opt out. <laughs> I think that was very clever of them. And I'm yeah. sort of tagging onto it myself now, too. <clears throat> Great. Agreed. Thank you. Commissioner Master? Yes, I, I think we should keep the windows. Um, the only question is does the green call so much attention to it that, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit more obvious. And, you know, I, I would look into exploring perhaps a darker shade um, in the hopes that, you know, it, the windows would kind of blend in a little bit more on this block. Okay. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I agree with all the comments um, that we should keep the windows, unfortunately. Yeah. But I think the um, the concern with the uh, with the color is correct. I think the uh, the it should be some darker shade. Uh, whether it depends on what uh, the majority team appropriate. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Chu. Agreed with the fellow commissioners' comments. Um, and it's not ideal to paint. I assume these are aluminum windows. Um, but you can you can paint aluminum windows. It's a it's doable. And I do agree that that is the, for me, the, 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 the most egregious part is the color itself. And it does draw more attention to the uneven uh, lights, top, bottom. Okay. All right. Great. So I think we have a consensus to approve with the modification that they paint the window sashes and frames a color, you know, a darker <laughs> color or a gray that will uh, relate to the rest of the row and, and uh, help the, and offset the offset sizes of the window sashes. Uh, I think if the color relates to the window colors in the rest of the row, that slight change in proportion won't be as noticeable. And um, I think that's a kind of compromise that we have approved before and uh, certainly also is less wasteful in this case. And I think that the one over one configuration is still dominant reading and that that slight offset doesn't detract from the row. So we'll go ahead and make a motion to legalize them with the condition that they paint, work with staff to paint them a color that will help them blend into the row. And Commissioner Ginsburg, would you be able to make that motion? I can't, thank you. Uh, with regards to LPC-23-04530, 21-2645th Avenue, Hunters Point Historic District, a neo grec style townhouse built in 1887 application is to legalize replacement of windows in non-compliance with certificate of appropriateness 19-31915. I note that the building style scale materials details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Hunters Point Historic District. I recommend Approval with modifications that the high performance simulated double hung replacement windows match the wood material one over one configuration and offset planes of the historic sash and recall the appearance of the historic windows. That the more prominent first and second floor of the primary facade upper sashes are only min minimally taller than lower sashes and do not call undue attention to themselves or diminish the special architectural character of the building or streetscape. And that the basement windows are separated from the others in the row by presence of a stoop and therefore taller 
upper sash more evident at this location do not appreci appreciably disrupt the fenestration pattern of the row. However, the green color of the windows highlights the difference in the dimensions and details of the sashes that the color of the window should be changed from a green to a dark black green or, or black. And the and I think the brick mold we're leaving is optional, should be, so we're not gonna add that, correct? I think not. I think we had a majority right. of commissioners okay. who were fine. So then I'm done and thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, and Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? No second. Thanks. Okay, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Oh, that's approved with that modification. Please continue to work with the staff on the finish and we'll move to the next item. The next item is public hearing item number three, LPC 23-09846, an application for a certificate of appropriateness number of Queens, block 8045, lot 58, 3615 West Drive in the Douglaston Hill Historic District. This is a colonial revival style freestanding house with attached garage built in the 1940s. The application is to replace windows. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. So you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. And then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Reza Perumani. Um, I am the applicant for this house, which is our house actually. Um, so it's located in Douglas Stone Historic District. Uh, the location, let me go back here. You can see the uh, location, which is uh, near facing the uh, West Drive. It's a corner of Regent Street and West Drive. West Drive is the main street that people, a lot of traffic for that neighborhood. So that would be the facing to the West actually. So West uh, facade facing, uh, facing the West Drive, as you see. These are the uh, pre uh, landmark or historic uh, figures that we got uh, through the uh, LPC staff. They help us to get these photos. Those are the historical photos. You can see that main facade on the left side and uh, the same view a little bit uh, from the north. And then this is the backyard when you're driving through the registry, that's the back facade. Um, <clears throat> these are the new uh, Pictures or photos from the same facade, you can see that we have uh, about 15 windows, existing windows, uh, rough iron windows, that we would like to replace them. And they've been tagged on these pictures and with the some close-up pictures of the existing condition. Um, these are the back or rear facade from the backyard uh, elevation. You can see uh, typical windows. This number six is a little bit anomaly. We believe that it's been changed in 80s. So that's not the original shape or material even that that one. The rest, uh, we think they are original windows. Um, these are the north facade that also could be seen from the uh, West Drive. Condition assessment, the windows are in a very poor condition. They've been rusted, uh, the glass are broken. There are single ply glass. Some of this glass has been replaced by actually plexiglass. They're not real glass even. Um, uh, they are not obviously insulated. Uh, they, the, 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 the paints are gone or, or half gone. They're not fully operable. They can be even closed when you open them. They're not fully sealed. We did a calculation that since last 90 years, these windows, if we use the new windows with a uh, U factor of 0.3 instead of what is currently, which is with guess it's about 1.3 or something, the delta of that would have caused of uh, 2,760 tons of uh, CO2 emissions. So if you keep keeping these windows for another next 90 years, that's how much emission would be going to the environment. So we would like, um, yeah, more pictures of the existing condition. You can see 
the I mean, like here, the mullion is all gone, like rusted. Um, <clears throat> these pictures are some value of what was the original for, uh, color. We think that was black, actually. There's like a little pro we did here. So the original color might not have been blue. This blue color is very appealing and we love it, but look like the original color was black. So uh, this is uh, previously approved in the same neighborhood. We find a few actually houses that they had uh, rough iron and there's been replaced by the uh, aluminum wood clad windows and which kind of trying to use the same material based on the previous precedents. And this is one of those. So we have selected a, uh, to use the uh, wood core aluminum clad windows one of the things we have to do was to make the egree size bigger than current so the encasement would, would be a little bit would be larger to comply with the egree size just for the upstairs uh, <clears throat> uh, bedrooms but we apply to the entire house so that 24 inch is one of the key uh, issue that we have and obviously we make the u value less than 0.3 which looking for 0.26 but to, to be less than 0.38 we try to keep the same exact configuration, which is the colonial grid, the same number. If it's four by four lights, we keep the same thing exactly. Operation, obviously, we keep the same things, casements swinging out, uh, exterior finishes, since right now it's rough iron. So we choose aluminum clad, kind of match the old charm, and the column, exact the same color, um, probably black, so it would be more to the original one and obviously use the wood as to be more sustainable. Uh, again, this is the uh, west facade, predominant facade. You can see that we have five windows to replace. The rest of these windows in the sunroom, we're not replacing, we keep them because we don't need to insulate them. So the only one that we have to insulate for the thermal, thermally broken, so we are replacing with these new five windows, as you can see on the bottom picture so new and existing back uh, backyard same thing changing uh, uh, about nine windows on the backyard and this number six that was or is changed somehow somewhere probably in 80s it changing kind of to resemble the original 30s or 40s uh, yeah these are the close up of the each Pipe of the windows, you can see these are the original rough iron windows uh, with the uh, with the um, casement in the middle, we're changing with the uh, uh, wood core aluminum French windows. The reason we're using to use the, the French uh, casement to have the minimum sight line as we can. Other types, you can see how we're changing it. Uh, vertical section, it is a brick veneer building, as a matter of fact, it's not fully brick. And as you saw, that was an like acid wash brick. Obviously, we're not changing anything. Luckily, the windows are sitting in the frame part, so we don't need to disturb any facade breaks. So we put them back in the, uh, the uh, frame side, basically. So the new windows, you can see that and horizontal section. Uh, and with that, that's all is end of my presentation. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, let's move to public testimony. If you'd like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, we did not receive any signups beforehand for this item. I am looking through the attendees list to see if there are any hands raised. There are none. So I will just note for the record that Queens Community Board 11 recommends approval. And I'll bring it back to you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so commissioners, any final questions before we move to our discussion? Okay, I'm going to ask you all to unmute so we can begin our discussion. And um, Commissioner 
Oh, sorry, Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, this is a late building for this style, colonial revival style, and a, a later building in this historic district. Uh, <coughs> which some of you know that we have a master plan for changes in this historic district, which identifies post-World War II buildings to be non-contributing. So this is a 1940 building. It's a little bit on the later end of the buildings in the district. Um, it is a, absolutely a colonial revival style in its features and expression. And this is a proposal to replace these steel windows with new um, aluminum clad wood windows that would um, match the number of panes, but would change because the details change slightly, would change uh, where the uh, framing members are. And so, um, uh, you know, I think I would note that the buildings of this style had could have had either wood or steel windows. So uh, I think that the unlike some of the Art Deco apartment buildings, where the metal window or the steel window is sort of more consistent with the style. I think the style lends itself to different opportunities. Um, and this is certainly a material we've approved in the district before. So we can uh, we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Sure. I, I'm impressed with the analysis and the careful analysis that, that was done in this uh, this window window design system. I I I I think this is appropriate. I think it was well thought through, and the the design and placement is carefully yeah. done. So I can approve this. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Lutfi. Yes, I, I agree with Commissioner Jefferson. I think the uh, applicant has done a really good and thorough job, and I can approve this. All right, Vice Chair Bland. Uh, I would agree. Had this been a streamlined building from 1940, I don't think we'd right. be approving this uh, like this. Uh, we would be looking for a, a steel window replacement. Um, but I believe what you've said earlier that this might well have been a wood window initially. And now it will be. Great. <clears throat> Commissioner Chu. Yeah, I agree with Commissioner Bland. I, it's it's these the old windows are so beautiful because they're so delicate, but they have zero <laughs> insulating value whatsoever. Um, and unless you go through the tremendous cost of Hope's thermally broken windows, which most people cannot afford, um, I think that the Marvin clad is is a perfectly acceptable option. It was probably the most performing from an energy perspective. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Master? I agree. This is appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Ginsburg? I agree. Appropriate. And Commissioner Chen? Uh, same here. Okay. So I think we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make the motion? Sure. In the matter of LPC-23-9846-36 15 West Drive, Douglaston Hill Historic District, application is to replace windows. I know that the building style, scale, material, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historical character of the Douglaston Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the building is at an age and style for which both steel and wood casement windows were historically used in similar compositions, that the existing steel windows are deteriorated beyond repair, that the proposed windows replace, replacements will be in keeping with the overall aesthetic of the historical historic, historic fenestration I will maintain the architectural <laughs> style of the house, that the proposed aluminum clad wood windows will match or recall the operation configuration and finish that various steel windows are various steel windows, helping to minimize the differences in dimensions and detail, and that the proposed work 
will not detract from the special architectural and historical character of the buildings of the historic district. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. Right. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved, thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number four, LPC 23-06421, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 500, lot 7505, 101 Green Street in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. Uh, this building is a modern recreation of a historic building designed by Joseph Paul Lombardi and constructed in 2002 pursuant to C of A 99-4693. The application is to install a banner sign. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing and the staff will be taking you through the presentation. Good afternoon, commissioners. Marcello Pacheco, preservation staff. This item is 101 Green Street, which is located in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District between Prince and Spring Streets. In 2021, an application was reviewed and approved by the commissioners for work at the storefront, which included refinishing the existing storefront infill and installing a new metal bracket sign and wood finished armature, um, as shown in these photos uh, <coughs> on this sheet. The current application seeks to remove the metal bracket sign and install a, um, sorry, here are some uh, examples of the um, uh, some similar banners and signage throughout the district. And here is their proposal, which is to remove the metal, metal bracket sign and install a uh, white banner sign with black lettering to the existing commission approved armature as shown on this sheet. Um, the applicant is here to answer any questions. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, let's see if we have any public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through any testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, we did not receive any signups for this item. I am looking through our attendees list and I do not see any hands raised. So I will note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 2 Recommends approval provided that the LPC staff verify that it conforms to the regulations for the building and the district. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. All right, sorry, I think my computer froze. So um, community, just Gregory, so I remember, uh, get it. Community Board 2 recommended approval? E, that is correct, they recommended approval. Great, thank you. I just, my, my internet must have frozen right at that moment. Okay, so I just like to turn to the applicant and ask if there's anything they'd like to say before we move to our discussion. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Sorry, yes. I was on mute. Okay. Uh, no, nothing to add. It's just, you know, to uh, be clear that we want to change the uh, blade signage for a current uh, fabric flag, and that's it. The armature will remain as is. Okay. All right. So if there are no other questions, Commissioner, I'm gonna, commissioners, I'm going to ask you to unmute so that we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. <clears throat> All right, Commissioner Chu, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion um, for uh, this application, but which is... only talks to, about climbing oops, Is only uh, to replace the rigid sign on this uh, bracket 
with a, a fabric banner type sign of similar proportion. So we'll begin that discussion. Commissioner Master, would you like to start this one? Sure, I'd love to. Um, I think this is an easy one. Um, we're essentially replacing um, the flag with a flag that's identical in size and position to the existing one. And uh, I guess flags like this are uh, also common in this historic district in the retail stores. So I can find this appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi? I agree, appropriate. All right, Commissioner Ginsburg? I agree, appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Chen? Yeah, same here, I agree. All right, Commissioner Bland? It should all be so easy. <laughs> Commissioner Chu. Appropriate. Okay. And Commissioner Lutfi. I think you got me. Oh, I got you. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think I missed. Oh, Commissioner Jefferson. I agree. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Thanks. So, Commissioner Master, would you make the motion? Sure. Um, in the matter of LPC 23 06421, 101 Green Street in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. Um, a modern recreation of a historic building designed by Joseph Pell Lombardi and constructed in 2002 pursuant to Certificate of Appropriateness 994693. Application is to install a banner sign. I note, I recommend approval finding that the size of the proposed banner will match the commission approved bracket sign dimensions and will not conceal or overwhelm the storefront or the facade, that the proposed banner will be attached to an existing commission approved armature installed at non-historic infill, and therefore its installation will not damage any historic fabric, that flags and banner signs of a similar type and size are found on other buildings with retail uses in this historic district and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Soho cast iron historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Second. Thank you. And Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so that's approved, thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Okay, and I'm actually going to read in uh, the next two items together. They are for the same building and project and will be presented concurrently. Uh, both pertaining to 290 Hen Henry Street, AKA 286 to 292 Henry Street and 333 to 343 Madison Street, the St. Augustine's Chapel, uh, former All Saints Free Church individual landmark. Uh, this is a late federal style church with Georgian Gothic detailing attributed to John Heath, built in 1827 to 1829 and later altered in an attached parish house designed by Adams and Woodbridge architects built in 1961 to 1963. So item five is LPC 23-03684. That's an application for a certificate of appropriateness. And the application is to demolish the parish house and construct an attached mixed use tower, alter the areaway, install a rooftop balustrade, lighting and replace windows. And then item six, LPC 23-06783, an application for a modification of use in bulk. Uh, this is an application to request that the Landmarks Preservation Commission issue a report to the City Planning Commission relating to an application for a modification of use in bulk pursuant to Section 74711 of the Zoning Resolution. Hey, Commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, Michael, you are going to have to um, unmute yourself on the phone. And... James, I'm going to give you control of the presentation for the team. Okay. And um, whoever wants to start, please do so. But anyone who speaks, please state your name for the record before you do so. Thanks. Good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Nathaniel St. Pierre. I am the rector 
meaning priest at uh, St. Augustine's Church. I have been there for the past uh, 11 years. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, hearing us and, and thank you for your attention. Uh, upon my arrival at St. Augustine's, uh, I found uh, a congregation that was dwindling and, and uh, it's a black poor congregation with uh, no means to uh, keep up and uh, maintain uh, the building, which was uh, the historic landmark uh, on premises. This was a building with lots of deferred maintenance uh, uh, that the congregation could not afford. And since we are part of the larger entity, a diocese, the diocese also didn't have the means to, uh, to keep up. So very quickly, uh, uh, we started studying uh, on how can we keep the landmark and also support the congregations. Uh, we hired uh, Denim Wolf, uh, a real estate broker, uh, to find us a developer who would uh, uh, suggest how to redevelop uh, uh, the space and keep both the congregation and that so nice uh, worship space. So that's how we got introduced to uh, NFW and Fulcrum, uh, uh, two partners very involved in development for nonprofit organizations. And since then, they have been valuable partners of the church. Uh, last year, uh, uh, our boilers, uh, uh, got damaged and could not support us anymore, which was a 60 years old boiler. Uh, they got involved and helped us went through uh, uh, the winter. So I am happy uh, to introduce now uh, Jack Henney, who is uh, uh, one of those developers who have been so helpful to St. Augustine's and also thank you for listening uh, uh, to my introduction speech. Thank you, Father Nat. Uh, my name is Jack Heaney with Falcon Properties, uh, along with NFW Group. I'm one of the co-developers for this project. Um, as Father Nat had uh, said in his introduction, my partners and I were introduced to him and his board a few years back through their owner's representative, Denim Wolf. And at those initial meetings, we listened to what their programmatic needs were and what their vision was for their home. And out of those uh, kind of listening sessions came three guiding principles for this project. Uh, the first is to build as much affordable housing as possible at rents affordable enough for residents living in this section of the Lower East Side. The second is to restore and preserve St. Augustine's historic church, which predates the Civil War and still has the original slave galleries where recently freed slaves would have worshipped at the time. And finally, beyond physically preserving St. Augustine, the third goal is to preserve it financially by creating a long-term annuity that allow uh, Father Nat and the congregation to expand their mission in the community and provide continuity to their congregation for generations to come. So these guiding principles resulted in this project, which will be the restoration of St. Augustine Church, which addresses long delayed preservation and capital improvement issues that Father Nat cited, uh, and the demolition of the underutilized 1960s parish house, which was never a contributor to the church's unique historic character. The footprint of the parish house Sorry. The footprint of the demolished parish house and the available air rights above St. Augustine's will then be utilized to create a new 21-story mixed-use building, which is set back from the historic church and faces Madison Street. This will house 120 affordable homes with a neighborhood retail and a new two-story annex space for St. Augustine, uh, used as a connector between the old and the new architectural elements of the project. Uh, Michael, can we go back to slide the second slide, please? I think you jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, one more back to the to the render. yeah perfect um <clears throat> so the tool that'll allow our team to bring this project to a built reality is the 74711 landmark preservation special permit and to the right on this slide are the various zoning bulk waivers required for rear yard minimum distance height and lot coverage being sought from the department of city planning uh next slide please oh, uh, next slide. Thank you. Oh, one back. Uh, yeah, perfect. So uh, St. Augustine Church is located in the heart of the Lower East Side and is a through lot bound by Henry Madison Streets. Across the street along Henry uh, is PS 134. To the south and to the east are the Vladic Homes, one of the early public housing projects completed in 1940. And to the west is a one-story commercial building that is part of the 21-story Governor Gardens apartment complex. Uh, zooming out a bit further, you'll see that the neighborhood is bound on all sides by 20-plus story towers, 
built in response to various urban renewal plans in the mid 20th century, as well as the FDR and the East River. Uh, can we skip to slide uh, five, please, with the Sanborn maps? Thank you, it's a little bit out of order. So this slide helps further illustrate the dramatic effect these various urban renewal plans had on this section of the Lower East Side, which was at the time a largely dense tenement housing prior to 1930 and is now dominated by mid and high rise tower in the park complexes today. Uh, and then, sorry, can we go back to slide three, please? Thank you. Um, oh, next slide, slide three. With the yeah, perfect. So zooming back into St. Augustine, these two historic photos on the left, as well as the current photo on the right, illustrate that we're fortunate that the bulk of the church's exterior elements, including the Manhattan Schist facade, has largely survived intact over the past almost 200 uh, years. Next slide, please. Uh, these current photos show St. Augustine in its modern context, including a detailed photo on the roof of the 1960s parish house where it abuts the uh, historic church. And next slide, please. One more. Thank you. Uh, and these are three recent LPC approved projects that serve as a guide for our team where an individual landmark was preserved and its unused air rights were utilized to build a new contextually appropriate building adjacent to it. Um, I think the most relevant example of these three would be the St. James Episcopal Church, which is actually the same diocese um, as St. Augustine. And from that, I'm gonna hand things back over to Michael. Uh, Michael, you may be on mute. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? We, hear us now? Uh, we can't. There's a lot of echo. Um, If when you unmute, can you just make sure there are no other devices running? Yeah, I think you have two open mics in the same room. Hey, Michael, can I make a quick suggestion? Uh, if you have headphones handy, maybe um, use those to join and then mute the other microphone. So that way you won't pick up the background noise.
Hi, Michael. This is James Rousseau, Preservation's Preservation Staff. Can, I muted. James, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was I was advancing the slides there. Um, if, if you could just call your Michael called in, uh, but he was unable to accept as a participant. We just need him to call in again and hit star six to unmute his phone. That was emailed, but I. I Perhaps we want to move on to the design of the tower and we can come back to the restorative work afterwards. Thank you, Caroline. I was just going to suggest that. That's a good idea. Thank you. Okay, so um, Jack, uh, Jack Esterson, um, yes. we jump ahead to you. Yes, can everyone hear me? Um, Yes, and then Misha, are you still in control of the slides? So we could jump ahead to the design portion. Okay. Perfect. There we go, cool, thank, thank you. Oh, perfect, okay, thank you. All right, Jack. All right, yes, well, You're on. thank you. Okay, thanks. Jack. There's two Jacks here. It's very confusing. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jack Esterson. I'm a principal at Sync Architecture, uh, practicing in New York for 48 years, a huge lover of the city and our historic treasures like this church, and also of great modernist architecture and how those two things um, interact successfully, hopefully, and make the city such a great, vibrant place. And that was really core to the way we approached this project in terms of the residential component. Um, and I would characterize that as one of great admiration for this building and a certain level of humility. I, I guess that's a word architects don't often use, but um, that we're trying to achieve a building that is, um, yes, 21 stories, but uh, in a way, very deferential to the church. And this, our strategy was one of a certain kind of qu quiet um, elegance. I don't really like the word neutrality. That's a word that's been used on this project, um, but one that really defers to the church and showcases it in a way that it's it's not a kind of a intricately articulated or kind of a show-off building, uh, particularly the facade that does face the church, uh, north, the north facade. Um, I was going to go through these slides very quickly because Michael was going to precede me, um, but and the, because these are of the context of the site, which you can see, as Jack said, in the middle of the Lower East Side. Next slide, please. And I will go, I, there's an awful lot of slides, so I'll go through them quickly. Jack explained the site, its location, its immediate surroundings, uh, historical photographs of the church, the zoning, the lot the current condition, the annex. Uh, as Jack explained, that will be torn down. Um, next slide, please. Uh, his, his current fo uh, photographs um, of the church and the annex, uh, the photograph in the, in the lower uh, middle is uh, an existing forecourt, which I will speak to in more detail in a minute, which we're revamping completely as part of the project. Next slide. Uh, ways in which the existing annex touch the church, which we we're ve very uh, concerned about. Um, and particularly interesting to us was the pictures on the upper right, which indicate the ghost of a, a Gothic window that was shut, uh, blocked off during the construction of the annex, which we will reveal as part of this uh, project and reopen and, and uh, have a continuous full set of windows on that face. Next, uh, more historical uh, photographs. Um, Michael will go into much more detail 
uh, about the history of the building and its uh, kind of iterative phases, uh, the steeple, lack of steeple, et cetera. Next. So site plan, um, the obviously the projects in the middle of the page, um, one story building uh, to the west, which will very likely be developed at some point, um, the six story public housing uh, to the east and to the south, uh, the, the school across from Henry Street and a playground uh, on the uh, northwest of the site. The church obviously and the darker ochre is the uh, 21 story portion uh, that is 30 feet south of the church uh, uh, rear facade uh, and a one story connector which will serve as a landscaped roof garden for the uh, people that live in the in, in the tower. Next. So we looked at massing. Uh, we ended up with a, a rather slender uh, 55 uh, foot wide building, um, 21 stories uh, with a one story connector, as you can see, uh, that touches, does touch the uh, uh, rear facade of the church. Um, and th these, this and the next page uh, are the beginning of our thinking of this project uh, with three essential components. Number one, the lower several floors, uh, which would be clad in brick, which would convey a certain weight and um, gravitas, I guess. It would be a warm, medium gray brick, not meant to mimic the church. We looked at a lot of different bricks. Some were extremely variegated, lights and darks. The Manhattan schist of the church has very pale and very dark stone. And it, and it just seemed like the wrong thing to do to try to mimic in any way that texture. So we picked a brick or we propose a brick that is um, complementary in color without competing with that beautiful texture. Um, and the tower arises out of that base as a much lighter um, a skin, which would be fiber cement board rain screen in a, in a kind of pale warm gray not white. Um, it would be, in a sense, a kind of a grid. It would feel and look much, much lighter. The windows in the lower section would be at least eight inches recessed from the facade. In the tower, it would be closer to four. So, ah, thank you. Um, so this, this, is, um, this is actually the uh, tower cladding. Um, could, we, could we go one previous to this? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm trying to go in order of ascent, right? And so the base is, this is a corner of the brick uh, lower zone. Um, and as, as you can see, the windows are deeper. Uh, the windows are uh, not bronze, but a bronze colored finish, um, as well as the lower panel and the windowsill itself. Again, pushed back at least eight inch, a full brick width. Um, next slide. And this, no, yeah. So uh, this is the tower at its edge. Um, so the north and south facades, which are the major facades, are essentially a very light gray grid. The windows are larger. It is not meant to look like masonry. It is meant to convey a sense of lightness uh, and elegance. Um, uh, in, and as a, in a sense, a kind of a backdrop on the north facades of the church. Next. Um, I'm so sorry. Could we go a couple images previous? Um, yeah, what, one more. One more. Okay, I think we're missing a slide because there is an interstitial zone which comes between the tower and the base, uh, which is a darker material meant as a no. Go, let's go forward, uh, which is meant as a kind of reveal between the two essential vocabularies. This is the palette. It is we we very often work with color in our projects, particularly our affordable housing. This was felt like not a project that was about color. It was about texture, uh, elegance of proportion, window sizes, detailing, deference to the church. So we kept the palette very neutral. Uh, the center um, panel in, in the bottom is the brick. Uh, the image on the left is the uh, schist, Manhattan schist of the church. The uh, central image in the middle of the page is a fiber cement board that is uh, a gray and is recessed 
um, about 18 inches in from the facade of the brick. So it's really meant as a reveal between the lower zone and the tower. And then the upper sort of tan color is fiber cement board rain screen, which is uh, a panel system. Uh, the smaller pieces on the uh, far right are wind window colors. Um, so the lower zone would have the darker bronze and then the tower would have a lighter gray. This is a, um, a standard color that Intus windows come in. We're, we're now proposing hundreds of custom uh, colored windows, but this luckily was a good gray that worked with this, the palette that we, that we are proposing. Uh, next slide. Oh, yeah, so yes, thank you. So um, th these are the actual samples um, rather than uh, representations of the samples. Uh, and we went to the church last week on a sunny day and thought this was an important image of the three essential cladding materials uh, as a backdrop to the church. You can see the variegation of the stone from light to dark. Next. And by the way, I'm so sorry, the, the brick we're proposing uh, is in a Norman size, which is uh, rather narrow and long. It's a 12 inch long by two inch high or two and a quarter inch high. So, we, we, and we love that. It's a sort of elegant brick. It's not a jumbo brick. It's a more elegant uh, brick. This is simply a sort of a piece of the brick lower portion. So we could see the proportion. The windows are slightly smaller to give the piers between more mass. We want the lower zone to read, again, as a, a kind of heavier, deeper uh, building upon which the tower springs from. Next. This is the interstitial zone, sorry. So that would be the kind of the medium gray, imagine this to be 18 inches recessed um, behind the brick. Uh, next. And this is the tower. You can see it reads more as a, a non-masonry gridded, uh, more lightweight um, uh, panel system. Next. Ah, and this is the composite of the lower, the interstitial, and the upper uh, tower zone in its kind of complete uh, composition. Next. So the building in its context, this is a large scale context. Um, and again, the NYCHA housing to the south, which is, I believe, six stories. Um, uh, and then to the uh, west, as Jack Heaney described, the 21-story Gouverneur houses ab about a block away. Next. We're kind of zooming in in scale. We keep zooming until you get really close to the building. Um, uh, the, the, the tower portion of the project was um, quite simple. It, it shaped up to be a rectangle with two stairs at the ends and a central core. Um, and 120 units. Um, we kept the facade that faces the church facing north to be very neutral. We often, with buildings of a certain scale, look to articulate them much more, break them down, either with form, shape, or color, or all, all the above. Here we said, no, it's let's set a, a, an elegant grid, light color, let it be fabric, let it be an elegant backdrop, do not compete with this gem. Um, to mediate between these two scales, um, we, as Jack had mentioned, we have a two-story kind of cube, uh, which programmatically is an, 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 we call it the amenity pavilion. And you will see much more detail of that in a minute. Uh, that is meant to provide um, a lounge, a computer room, that sort of thing for the residents, uh, but also on the ground floor, um, added space, uh, for the church uh, itself. Um, elevations, um, the uh, one on the left is the uh, west elevation, the one on the right is Madison. Here we did articulate the building. So the brick uh, that generates um, from the east facade kind of spirals around the building and jumps up. And we felt that on Madison, that was actually a good thing to do. Um, and in fact, the, the first setback relates, uh, we think, quite well to the public housing directly across the street from Madison. It's a kind of a gesture uh, to that housing across the street and actually next door as well. And it spirals around and then finally terminates 
uh, at, at the west uh, wall elevation. So this was meant um, to kind of integrate the lower uh, zone with the tower. So we did not actually want it to read as the kind of typical 1960s tower on a plinth. We thought it was more interesting and a richer uh, building solution to let this spiral happen where it should happen. Um, the west elevation also indicates how we are connecting to the church. Uh, right now, the masonry annex um, touches the schist. We did not want to do that. We pulled it back about, 50, about 15 feet. And on both sides, east and west side, uh, the, the building connects to the church with a glass uh, and metal uh, link. We call it the glass link. Um, more on that in a minute. Next slide. Uh, this is a section cut through the, um, the one-story uh, piece that connects the tower with the church. Uh, you are looking south at the amenity pavilion on the left, uh, which I believe at, gr at ground level, eye level, really does serve as a kind of mediation between the church and the tower. Um, now, and, <laughs> the drawing got to be so long, we of course cut it, and we wanted to show a little more detail on how the building terminates at, at the top. Um, in a modernist way, but in a way also somewhat classically as, a, as an exceptional um, sort of capital, so to speak. Uh, the roof of the one-story piece will be a landscape garden, again, for the use of the residents that live in the building. Next. Lots of drawings, perspectives. This one, th this um, is an important page because on the left um, is the current condition, um, which is the annex. As Jack mentioned, it's, well, maybe it's a matter of opinion, but it's, it's not one for the record books. It's, it's a, an okay 1960 building. Um, I usually mourn the loss of buildings. This one maybe is uh, not so great. And what I, I think more importantly, the way it kind of grabs onto the um, southeast corner of the church is not great for the church itself. Back in those days, I think they were less, perhaps less sensitive to that. The image on the right is what we're proposing. We are releasing that corner. We're pulling back. The pavilion does not touch the church. Um, the, of course, obviously the tower doesn't. The only piece that does is the one-story connector, which under which is church facilities, new church facilities and amenities. Um, and even that is somewhat recessed from the plane of, of the church. Again, we'll see more on that in a minute. Next. Uh, this, this is also an important sheet because it's cut through the forecourt. We, we, we are calling it the forecourt. It is a long uh, rectangular space that is owned by the church um, that is to the east, directly to the east of, of the church. Um, it is currently um, uh, full of ADA ramps going, bringing you from Henry Street down to the cellar. So most of this courtyard is ramps that go down and pipe, steel pipe railing. It's not lovely, but it was important to create ADA accessibility to the cellar. But because the church does not currently have an elevator, the main sanctuary space remains inaccessible currently. What we have done is re we've rethought this forecourt. We are demolishing the ramps. And instead of going down, we are making a very slight incline up. So we are, of course, um, starting at, on the right at Henry Street, inclining a few step risers up to the main sanctuary level. And then you turn right into this new glass entry link. And once you're in there, there's an elevator that can then bring you down to the cellar. The cellar is important. There's a large uh, undercross, which is an event space, very widely, you know, heavily used. Um, uh, so we are providing full ADA accessibility to the church. Thank you. So. Um, related to that section is this drawing, which is a close, more of a close-up of the link. Uh, the link is recessed from the back from the uh, schist wall of the church. Um, so that, again, it's, it kind of defers to the uh, to the historic building um, in as light a touch as we possibly could. But it also kind of it gives the church a kind of we think a, a, a more dignified entry. Because currently you go down concrete ramps into the cellar and then find your way up to the sanctuary. It's, it's not so lovely. Next, please. Uh, 
Uh, this is a plan of uh, the landscape plan. Uh, Henry's on the right, and one we, we kind of talked to Father Nat and and Jack and his partners about making this uh, a lovelier space. It is a slight incline. It would serve uh, as a social space for the church. It is directly adjacent to a ground floor space in the pavilion that will be a great room that is has a lot of glass. And at, at night, it could be a, a kind of a wonderful beacon uh, uh, looking um, uh, south from Henry Street. Uh, this also shows an area way. Uh, obviously, we are not uh, going to build an inclined new courtyard up against the schist wall. That would not be good. There are windows uh, in the basement. Uh, so we are maintaining the old access route down to the cellar, not as an ADA route, but um, as a way to get there. We are, um, uh, again, so we're pr uh, providing ADA accessibility where that little arrow is on the left. Um, and the photograph on the, on the right is existing uh, conditions. It is truly a, a, a rather large space. It's kind of full of ADA ramps. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so a um, lot of drawings. Uh, this is the West Elevation. We, we show this really because maybe not so many people will experience it. This is actually, there's an alley here. But we just simply wanted to demonstrate that we are repeating the basic architectural gesture of glass, connecting to the church, uh, reflecting the other side, which and this is not an entry, um, but it is uh, very similar to the link on the other side. Next. Yeah, so zooming in a little more, um, the church, well, it's new balustrade. Michael will talk about that. I, I love that. It's so great. And then the, the um, tower is this kind of lightweight gridded backdrop, really trying not to compete. Thank you. Zooming into the pavilion. Uh, on the left of the pavilion, it would be brick, the beginning of the spiral. The spiral goes from two-story, seven-story, nine-story as it spirals around on Madison. Um uh, recessed from that is the so-called link, which would serve as the main entry space for the new church facility. And this is a drawing we just, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, a drawing we just actually created to demonstrate the, the recess and uh, to restore that corner. Most of that wall from the corner to the window, uh, the Gothic window, will be newly exposed. It's been concealed by the annex for many, many, many decades. We love this part of the project because of the, the notion of freeing up this corner. The Gothic window is currently blocked up. Um, uh, and Michael will talk about what, what will come in the future to complete that row of five uh, Gothic windows. Uh, next. Yeah, so we a lot of drawings. We also created, we thought our drawings were a bit architecturally pure so to speak, and really uh, uh, kind of does not indicate the urban messiness of the Lower East Side of, of, and the grit of what's really there, like cars and street lamps and trees and, you know, all that. So we did these photo montages, which are kind of duplicative of the other drawings you've seen, but we thought it was really important to show the building in its grit, grittier, real context. So there's 10 of these. We can go through them fairly quickly because they're similar. Thank you. Yes, so, and these are not dupli duplicative. These are more neighborhood shots. Um, from Henry Street, you're, this, this one is as if you're in the playground, which is um, to, to the uh, northwest of the project. Um, so you're seeing it from about a block away, looking south. Uh, yeah, thank you. And then next. Yeah, so this this is looking at, at the Madison facade. Um, if you're in the NYCHA houses, a, about a block away also. The one-story commercial building is the red piece on the left. That white framed piece in our project is actually defining the commercial space um, uh, in a more slightly more deliberate way. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Next, please. Thank you. So the, this is on Henry Street across the street. Uh, looking southeast uh, with the tower juxtaposed. This is looking across the street, centered on the church directly. Uh, we, we wanted to really see what a 21-story building would look like if you were across the street, dead center on the building. And this is 
This is it. Next. Ah, um, so I'm going uh, further down Henry Street, uh, which would be to the west, uh, it, uh, by at least a block, a little bit more than that, um, is how this building reads in its urban context. Next, I think we went backwards. I think we're, yeah, forward. Yep, yeah, thank you. Keep going. Yes, thank you. So this is looking um, north. Uh, again, you're even farther away. You're in the public housing now about a block away. And of course, there's gaps between these six-story buildings, and this is one of those gaps. Next. This is really quite, well, about a block and a half, maybe. Um, you are now at the Gouverneur uh, Houses, also public housing. Th these buildings are 21 stories, so it's a kind of even match. Uh, and there are, as Jack said, many of these sort of towers in the park sprinkled uh, sprinkled around the neighborhood. Next, cross-section showing the, uh, obviously the relationship of the church and the tower. Um, uh, again, it's, a, it's 30, exactly 30 feet um, space. If we made that more, the tower would not be feasible. It would be extremely thin. Um, and uh, the darker blue space is new space for, for the church facilities. Uh, this is the cellar, uh, which uh, the, the, it shows two areaways flanking the church. The one on the top is existing. We are not changing it. Michael has a restoration plan. Uh, the one on the, on the, on the bottom uh, facing east is the result of the um, slightly inclined new forecourt pulled back uh, from the church, so we're not touching it. Next. Uh, this is kind of the whole project, right? So we have this the church, obviously, the newly thought out forecourt. The darker uh, uh, blue is the amenity pavilion. The ochre is the residential lobby. Uh, and the light gray on Madison is a commercial rental space. The lighter blue and is I wonder if, Yes? Mr. Esterson, I wonder if we could hold the floor plans for in case there are questions. And, Perfect. Uh, okay. May I go to the rendering, which is the last slide? Yeah, uh, great. Last, there you go. And I just, whoops, I just wanted to end it with the rendering because, you know, one does that as an architect. <laughs> so um, okay, great. there you go. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. And the, the bulk waivers that you're seeking are to uh, have some relief on the depth of that courtyard so that your building can be set back from the church, but still wide enough to be feasible. Yes. Are there other bulk one, waivers? One. Yeah, Jack, do you want to? Speak to that. You had your list. Uh, sure. So, Misha, if you could go back to actually the second page of the entire presentation, we listed them on the right hand side next to the rendering. Yeah. Uh, Jack, uh, sorry. Actually, James is controlling the PowerPoint. Oh, I'm sorry, James. Oh, sorry. If you, if you don't mind, James, going to the very beginning. Sorry. So, there, uh, one, uh, one, one back. One more. There, there we go. There it is. Yeah. Um, okay, so so this, is a, this is the detailed list. Um, I'm happy to read them out loud if you'd like. Or just the, the main points of each one. Yeah. So we'll be so seeking to have a slightly less courtyard than is would normally be required. Correct. For a rear yard equivalent. Um, and then the other uh, waiver would relate to minimum distances between two buildings on a shared lot. Um, okay. And then we'll be seeking uh, height and setback uh, waivers. And we'll also be seeking a waiver on the maximum permitted lot coverage. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. All right. Now, um, as part of the proposal for the, um, spe the special permit at city planning, you are going to be proposing a preservation plan so that as one of our findings we have to make is that there's a preservation purpose. So I just wondered if the Lee Saltzman team was ready to present the scope and a list of restoration work. Yes, we are. And I sincerely apologize. We had a lot of difficulties with our conference uh, telephone, uh, but I'm here now. Okay. So I apologize. Great. 
And James, thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Again, my name is Michael Middleton. I'm an architect with Lee Saltzman Architects, and I will be presenting the preservation purpose or the proposed restoration of St. Augustine's Church. And just to start with some history of St. Augustine's, it was originally All Saints Church, and its origins lay in the founding of All Saints Mission in 1819 by students of the Episcopal General Theological Seminary. Five years after this, um, a parish was formed, and then between 1827 and 1829, the congregation started construction on the late federal-style church, uh, which featured large wood, triple-hung, Gothic lancet windows. Um, and the design of the schist and sandstone church is attributed to the early American architect, John Heath. The church was then expanded in 1848 to include a new rear chancel with three lunette windows, um, and the chancel is highlighted in red on the image to the right. Um, then in 1874, the church was further renovated to include new interior uh, decorative painting, and uh, the main lunette window over the altar was replaced with a stained glass window depicting Heinrich Hoffmann's 1871 uh, painting, Christ in the Temple as seen in the photograph in the bottom left. And it's likely um, at that time, all but one of the historic wood triple hung windows were replaced with new Victorian style diamond paned leaded glass windows. Um, uh, so yes, James, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so continuing with the church's history, the next major architectural intervention occurred in 1881 when a new uh, high Victorian Gothic style wooden slate belfry was installed on top of the original tower, which we see in both of these images. Um, then in 1934, All Saints was documented as part of the Historic American Building Survey, or HABS, and documentation from HABS indicates that prior to 1934, the original wood balustrade assembly seen in the 1881 rendering to the left was removed, and also that the secondary lunette windows at the chancel had been infilled with brick by that time. Then in 1949, All Saints merged with um, the uh, St. Augustine's uh, Chapel of Trinity Wall Street, and the two congregations used the Henry Street location for their parish, but took the name all of uh, St. Augustine's. Next slide, please. Um, then on, oh, sorry, uh, one back, James. Thank you. Uh, so on to more recent history of the church. Around 1960, the architectural firm of Adams and Woodbridge were engaged by St. Augustine's Church to design a new mid-century modern style annex building um, to the rear of the church, which was intended to serve as a rectory and office spaces. Um, but in addition, uh, Adams and Woodbridge were also tasked with renovating the 1829 church building, uh, which included the demolition of the circa 1850s rectory, uh, which was formerly at 292 Henry Street, uh, and this is where the current new courtyard is. Uh, also, the demolition of the 1881 Belfry, which was intended to be replaced with a new colonial style, uh, revival style steeple, though, which we see in the rendering, though that was never completed. Um, at this time, uh, all of the Victorian diamond pane stained glass windows and the one remaining historic wood triple hung window were removed and replaced with the current uh, aluminum frame pastel colored stained glass windows and protective glazing. Uh, there was also the cladding of the south and east elevations of the chancel with a brick veneer that, uh, that matched the annex, and this essentially encased the central lunette window. Um, there's also the enclosing of the southernmost window bay on the east elevation by the annex. So the footprint of the annex wraps around the east ele uh, elevation of the church and the two windows in this bay were infilled with CMU at that time. Um, and then lastly, there was the proposed installation of new concrete buttresses between each of the window bays on the east elevation. Uh, however, only one of these was ever completed. Um, so then five years after this, the church was designated uh, an individual New York City landmark in 1966. And 10 years later, St. Augustine's became independent from Trinity Wall Street. And lastly, the church was listed on the New York State and National Registers of Historic Places in 2004 and 2006, respectively. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so now to discuss the proposed preservation plan or the proposed restorative scope of work. Overall, the church will receive a robust restoration inclusive of masonry, wood, and metal repairs on all facades to return the building to a stable watertight condition. Uh, furthermore, the team is proposing to replace the building's large 1960s pastel colored stained glass lancet windows with new windows to better recall the original wood triple hung windows um, to reintroduce a wood balustrade. 
which served as the terminus of the tower prior to 1881 and to remove the other aspects of the 1961 renovation, uh, which will greatly return the church to its 1848 appearance prior to the later Victorian renovations. And while the scope of work that we will detail in the following slides is largely comprehensive, uh, there's just two items that the church is requesting to perform at a later time, they being the replacement of the existing asphalt shingle roof, uh, which was found to be an acceptable condition and as anticipated or estimated to still have at least a decade left of service life, and then also the interior re-exposure and restoration of the stained glass Christ in the temple um, lunette window. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so starting with the, the north of the primary elevation, I will go elevation by elevation, showing the proposed scope of work, uh, which will be divided by material, and it, each will have its own color and will be keyed on the elevation drawings. Um, but really starting with the general overall scope that will be applicable to all facades, uh, we're calling for a general cleaning based on the results of testing um, to determine the, the gentlest, most effective products in terms of the schist and sandstone, uh, masonry, repoint open or deteriorated mortar joints with new mortar to match the original in, in color composition and tooling per the findings of historic mortar analysis. Repair masonry cracks with new composite mortar, uh, matching uh, the, the adjacent stone in appearance to replace cracked or highly deteriorated sandstone elements um, with new to match the originals. And we see an example of this in the photograph at the top center of the crack springer. Um, and then lastly, to strip the non-historic coating 100% from the sandstone water table to restore its original appearance. And we see a um, photograph of that at the top right. Next slide, please. Continuing with masonry scope on this elevation, uh, we're proposing a full unit or partial unit replacements for the three decorative sandstone lintels over the entry doors, which are exhibiting cracking and even full unit cracking um, in some locations. And these also have previously been applied with a composite mortar patching, which has subsequently failed. Um, at brick cracking, the proposal is to remove salvage and repair with new stainless steel uh, pins and epoxy and reinstall in their original location and remove uh, existing highly deteriorated entry steps uh, assembly and replace them with new cast stone units uh, with the appearance to match the historic sandstone um, and the deteriorated cast stone steps we can see at the bottom left. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on then to the scope of wood repairs, uh, generally we're calling to strip the existing paint from all wooden elements, including the main entry doors, the main cornice, the pediments and the rakings, uh, all of which we can see in pink or purple on the slide and then survey the conditions of the upper underlying substrate and repair wood as required using either Dutchman or epoxy consolidation. Um, and then after repair work has been completed to repaint um, all of these elements per the findings of the historic paint analysis uh, for the time being, the assumption is that uh, most of the wood elements will be repainted as an off-white color and the door is as more of a burgundy color. Um, and then lastly, in terms of wood, the cornice at the tower was found to be in highly deteriorated condition and therefore it's recommended to be replaced 100% with new wood cornice assembly uh, to match the original and profile and species. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of metal repairs, uh, first scrape prime and repaint the existing tower louvers, again the assumed colors and off white, um, and then for the metal fence assembly at the west side of the church, uh, the proposal is to remove it, bring it to a shop uh, for its, its elements to be surveyed, prepare prime and repainted, all deteriorated elements would be um, repaired in kind and missing elements would be replaced with new to match the originals. Next slide please. Um, so now the scope of work, which was previously described, really falls into the categories of maintenance and repairs. In addition to this, as part of the 74711 agreement, the team is also proposing additional purely restorative aspects as part of the preservation plan. Uh, these efforts are largely intended to return the church to more closely to its 1848 appearance prior to the Victorian renovations of 1874 and 1881, and then the mid-century modern renovation, which took place in 1961. Um, so so here we can see a side-by-side -side comparison of the current appearance of the church on the left and the proposed restored appearance uh, on the right to circa 1848. Next slide, please. Uh, the pro proposed restorative aspects for the primary facade will include the uh, 
installation of a new wood balustrade assembly uh, at the tower to recall the historic based on the 1881 rendering of the church, which we see at the, the top left, as well as the description uh, of the balustrade assembly provided in the 1934 Habs written documentation. Um, other aspects are at the main entry doors, remove all of the non-historic uh, stainless steel hardware and replace with new hardware, recall, recalling the original based on historic photography. We see this at the bottom left. Um, and then also remove the uh, the 1960s colored uh, butt jointed transom windows above the entry doors and replace them with new clear glass uh, transom assemblies again matching what was seen in the in the Habs documentation. And then lastly at the center entry also to remove the non historic Gothic style lighting fixtures and replace these with new to recall the historic shown in in historic photography again at the bottom left. Uh, but really sorry James if you go back. Uh, back to 16, please. Thank you. Um, so perhaps the most transformative um, change would be the replacement of the existing 1960s aluminum frame pastel colored stained glass lancet windows uh, and their associated protective glazing with uh, new aluminum double hung lancet windows um, to recall the historic based on the Habs documentation. And we see a, an extract from the Habs documentation at the top right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so moving on now to the west elevation, uh, we'll start again with the, the repair scope. Uh, the, the same general scope of work as described for the north primary elevation will apply to all the elevations. So I'm just going to highlight the work uh, that's really specific to the west elevation in the following slides. So next slide, please. Uh, so a couple of scope items which differ from the primary elevation include the repair of open or previously repaired cracking at schist masonry with new mortar. Uh, we see that the top two photographs uh, to the right. Um, and then more extensively, the west retaining wall was found to be bowing in an extremely poor condition. So the proposed scope of work is to completely rebuild the schist west retaining wall, uh, but, also, but now to add new accommodations for water drainage, which was not there historically. And the idea is that the existing schist masonry will be removed, salvaged, and then reinstalled. And we see photographs of that to the, to the left. Next slide, please. In terms of sandstone elements on this facade, remove previously applied uh, inappropriate cementitious uh, crack repairs at the windowsills and replace with new composite mortar patching to match the adjacent stone. Example of this is at the top right. And as with the primary facade, strip, uh, strip the uh, sandstone water table 100% of its coating and then repoint. And there are units uh, we observed at the water table at this elevation, which are dislodged. So the plan is to remove salvage and reset those units. And we see that at the top center photograph. Um, and then in addition, one of the brick uh, enframements at the cellar window was observed to be separating from its masonry backup. And um, therefore, we're proposing to remove, salvage the existing bricks and then reinstall it back to stable substrate using stainless steel pins. Next slide, please. Uh, further scope of work on this elevation uh, includes the repair of the existing wood 10 over 10 double hung window assemblies and their window guards at the cellar level. Um, work is to include a replacement of the deteriorated glazing putty, repair of wood elements as required with Dutchman or epoxy consolidation, installation of new perimeter sealant, and then repainting the assemblies based on the finding of a historic paint analysis. Um, then, as with the primary elevation, the plan is for the removal of the west fence assembly um, for shop repairs, as previously mentioned, but also to remove salvage and reset the bluestone coping stones uh, into which the fence assembly itself is set. Next slide, please. Um, so again, this is a, a quick comparison of the existing west elevation against the proposed restored elevation. Next slide. Um, again, major restorative aspects is really the, the wood balustrade, um, but then in terms of the windows here too, the proposal is to remove the existing 1960s aluminum windows and replace them with new aluminum windows, uh, which recall the appearance of the original wood uh, triple hung lancet windows. And here we're proposing that the two bottom sashes operate as a double hung window, while the upper sash and then the transom are fixed. And so in addition to these items, we're also proposing to replace the existing non-historic a cellar pair door assembly with a new uh, wood pair door assembly and transom above to recall the historic doors per the Habs documentation and an extraction from the Habs documentation seen at the bottom left. Uh, next slide, please, James. Uh, so moving on to the south elevation, which is largely uh, currently concealed by the 1961 annex, which we see here. Next slide. 
so again, this elevation will receive the same level of masonry repairs as previously discussed. However, both sandstone and brick units were found to be a little bit more deteriorated on this elevation. So sorry, James, could you go back to 24? Yes, thank you. Um, so, so the uh, so really the the schist, uh, sorry, not the schist, the um, the sandstone and the brick were found to be in, in worse condition on this elevation, and therefore we're proposing that uh, all all of the sandstone elements uh, be surveyed and sounded, um, and then depending on their condition, either retooled back to existing stone or replaced with new units to match the originals in appearance, profile, and tooling. Uh, deteriorated at surface ball brick units would also be removed and replaced with new units matching the originals in appearance, profile, and texture, and we see examples of this uh, in the three photographs here. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of wood and metal, again, uh, we're calling for the tower cordis to be replaced 100%. We see an example of why we're calling for this at the, the top center photograph, and then a strip uh, the paint and survey the condition of the underlying wood strip straight at the gable ends. Uh, cornices are seen here in the drawing in purple um, and repair with wood Dutchman or epoxy consolidation as, as required, again, depending on the condition of the wood. And while the existing copper assemblies were found to be in good condition, um, most of the leaders, however, are being proposed for replacement. This is due to a combination that some are, most of them are aluminum and therefore they're not compatible with the historic copper gutters and others need to be resized for longer runs due to the modifications being proposed at the development site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as before, we can now compare the existing uh, elevation against the proposed elevation. And as you can see, with the demolition of the annex and the construction of the adjacent development site, a large amount of the south elevation, uh, which has been concealed for the past 60 years, will once again be re-exposed. I think this is a very telling image. Uh, next slide, please, James. Uh, restorative aspects for this elevation will include the uh, replicated wood uh, balustrade, um, and just as mentioned, this elevation will be transformed uh, due to the demolition of, this, of the annex, and this includes the removal of the emperor brick cladding at the south and east elevations of the chancel to re-expose the original masonry. Um, so we see at the image to the bottom left uh, is the currently cladded two elevations of, of the chancel. Um, and we're anticipating that once the, the clouding is removed, it will require 100% repointing and selective repairs to the original brick. Uh, furthermore, the demolition of the annex will re-expose the main lunette window and framing, and the rear side of the Christ and the temple stained glass window. Um, and so here it's, it's proposed that to install new vented protective glazing uh, at the exterior side of the window. Uh, as previously mentioned, the window will not be restored as part of the 74711 agreement, but the plan is for the church to re-expose the window uh, on the interior side and to restore it at a later time. And then lastly, uh, missing wood elements uh, removed to accommodate the annex, um, such as the east cornice will be rebuilt. Next slide. Um, so now we'll move on to the last facade, the east elevation. Next slide. Uh, again, uh, the masonry on this elevation uh, shares many similar conditions to the other facades, uh, which will require generally repointing crack repairs, the replacement of deteriorated brick and sandstone units, uh, including uh, here we had uh, deteriorated sandstone window windowsill units, uh, which can be seen at the top right. Next slide, James. Likewise, the general scope of work for wood and metal elements uh, will be repeated for the facade. However, cracked and broken glazing at the cellar windows were observed, and these will be replaced in kind. And also the cast iron lead, uh, leader inlets as well need to be replaced in kind. Next slide. Uh, again, this is another com uh, comparison slide showing the existing east elevation to the proposed um, 1848 appearance. And again, uh, this really goes to show how much of the building will be re-exposed once the annex is de demolished. Next slide. And as we've seen, uh, most of the restorative uh, aspects on this elevation actually mirror the west elevation, again, including the reintroduction of the, the balustrade, uh, the replication of the wood paired uh, cellar door assembly, both of which intended to recall the Habs documentation. Um, but again, the demolition of the annex will re-expose that southernmost window bay, as well as the former side lunette window at the chancel. Um, it's also proposed to assume that all re-exposed areas of masonry will require 100% repointing and selective repairs, um, including at the brick and frame and infill of the side lunette window. Next slide. Uh, 
I and mean, then as part of the demolition work, um, it will include the removal of the non-historic, non-structural concrete buttress added in 1961, the photograph we see at the top right. Um, again, the, there was a concrete buttress proposed to be installed at, between each window bay at this elevation. However, like the steeple, this was never carried out, um, but the demolition of the annex will also allow for the restoration of the wooden cornice, uh, which was again removed to accommodate the annex in 1961. And as with the east elevation, the proposal is to replace the existing 1960s aluminum framed uh, pastel colored stained glass windows with new windows recalling the historic triple hung windows, including at that re-exposed southernmost window bay. Um, and then also at that bay, uh, we will re-expose the cellar window and they were proposing a new wood 10 over 10 double hung window um, to match the others at the cellar. Next slide, please. Um, now to discuss further the proposed design for the new aluminum lancet windows to recall the historic wood uh, triple hung windows. Um, the team looked at several precedents uh, to inform the design. First, uh, we looked at the 1934 Habs documentation of the church, uh, which does include a detail of, of one of the uh, only remaining triple hung windows at that time. Interestingly, the drawing uh, only shows the profile of the window jam. Uh, there's no brick molding shown and there are no sash or muntin profiles delineated. And we see that drawing to the left. Um, next, we also looked at the Church of Sea and Land, which is literally down the street at 61 Henry. It was built between 1817 and 1819. Um, and it amazingly still retains its historic wood triple hung windows. And we see that in the center. And, and then lastly, LPC staff was kind enough to share a survey of, uh, of a wood Gothic lancet window from a late federal style church in Vermont, uh, which is seen here on the right. Next slide, please. And then so from those precedents, uh, the Habs documentation, as well as uh, our own survey of St. Augustine's own historic uh, double hung windows at the cellar, uh, we endeavor to recreate a possible likely appearance of the original wood triple hung windows, uh, really to serve as the basis for the replacement windows. So here at the right, we have uh, an assumed jam plan of the uh, wood windows extrapolated from a combination of the Habs documentation for the dimensions of the jam seen at the top left and the existing cellar windows for the proposed sash and mutton plant, uh, sorry, profile seen at the bottom left. Next slide, please. Um, so this in turn allowed us to create an assumed overall elevation of the historic windows seen to the far left. And the team is currently working with skyline windows uh, in the detailing of, of the proposed aluminum window replacements uh, using their series 100 double hung window system. Uh, the idea is for the new windows to replicate the historic appearance and construction of the wood windows as closely as possible. Uh, for example, the goal is uh, for the new sashes of the aluminum windows to recall the staggered planes of the wood triple hung windows. And while the uppermost sash is proposed to be fixed, the idea would still be to place this in the same plane uh, as it would have been historically to give an overall appearance that the window uh, still could operate as a triple hung window. Um, but with that being said, um, there will be some differences between the historic and the proposed windows just by the nature of the construction of aluminum. Uh, we can expect that the meeting rails and the transom bars will likely need to be thicker than what would be possible with uh, wood. Though through uh, conversations with Skyline, they believe that the the jam profiles could come close to the wood dimensions, um, and so we see in the center uh, the proposed elevation drawing. Uh, so just note the uh, the meeting rails and the uh, transom bar at the top, which uh, if, if you compare the two are 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 larger in, in dimension. And then lastly, another notable difference uh, is that the replacement windows are proposed to be constructed using a simulated divided light construction implementing uh, double pane insulated glazing units or IGUs in order to provide better thermal and acoustic performance for the church. And we see um, to the right uh, a comparison of the assumed historic mutton profiles at the top against the proposed at the bottom using Skyline's standard faux Munton profiles, uh, we selected the ones that most closely recall the assumed historic profiles. And uh, I guess in conclusion, ultimately it found success uh, acceptable. The team intends to continue to work with Skyline windows and LPC staff to further develop the proposed aluminum window details to ensure that they replicate the historic as closely as possible. And with that, thank you. We appreciate it. And again, I apologize for the, the hiccup before. Oh, no worries. And thank you. I know you went through that very quickly, but there was a lot of information. So thank you for being thorough. All right. Commissioners, do we have any questions on either the 
re, uh, restorative work, some of which uh, is will be approved at staff level and some will be approved, uh, will have to be reviewed and approved by the full commission, including the window replacement and the balustrade. Um, so there's the restorative work and then, uh, or if you have questions about the design uh, massing height of the new building. All right, Commissioner Chu, please go ahead. A um, couple questions. I think it's great. First of all, I just want to comment to see this partnership that allows this this historic church to be restored. I think that's fantastic because you know it, it's obviously a lot of work. I see a lot of good details from Lee Saltzman's office. I do have a question though. With all the work that's being done on the block, it does strike me as a shame to not get ADA accessibility to the front door and I wondered if there was thought about that or where is the ADA entry path in this redesign? Um, I, I can speak to that. Yeah. Uh, it, the ADA entrance uh, is at the new, what we keep calling the glass <laughs> link, uh, which is along the east rear elevation. Mm -hmm. um, we actually thought uh, really seriously modifying the stone steps on Henry Street would be kind of almost unimaginable in, in a way with ramps and pipe rally and that sort of thing. And it's very narrow. The sidewalk is really quite narrow. Mm. Um, so it quickly, we just dismissed that as a, even mm -hmm. a possibility. Mm. So, but we did see as an opportunity to create a slight incline up uh, because the floor level of the sanctuary is, I believe, three or four uh, step risers. Mm. So it's not it's not a great distance, but if you incline um, slightly, you achieve, you get to the level of the main sanctuary at the back of the building. So we tried to create that entrance, not as a rear entrance, but as a wide new elegant glass entryway that is not sort of a back door. Um, mm. And you go through this newly landscaped courtyard uh, to get to it. Mm. Should it be in the front? In spirit, yes. In mm -hmm. in practicality, and I don't know, maybe through the lens of you folks, no. <laughs> well, I, I just just, just, but I, just I, understand I, that's the presumptuous. Um, just What's to that? understand the challenge, the the distance. Well, yeah. Uh, the setback on the side court, which allows you, I assume, a one to twenty or or more shallow slope, right? Because yes. I don't see that as handrails or anything. That just seems like uh, an open open walkway that is ADA accessible. Yes. Okay. So you you would need that kind of run, right? So that's the challenge. I see that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the other question, and maybe this is something for Chair uh, Carol, is the the request is also to. The, the zoning here is a separate process to, to approve yeah. the extra height and, and bulk and setbacks. Yeah, so we have, there are two applications before us. One is for a certificate of appropriateness right. for certain changes. Uh, and that includes on the church building, the, win, the new windows and the balustrade and the, some of the, I think, barrier-free access um, walkways. And then it also includes removing the 1961 annex and constructing a new building on the landmark site because it still sits on the landmark site. So um, those are the components that are before us for the question of appropriateness to this individual landmark. Uh, it's not in a historic district. And then the second application is a request that LPC support their application at city planning for a modification of use in bulk. Mm -hmm. And the two findings that LPC needs to make in that uh, for that request to be approved is one, that there is a preservation purpose. And that means that in the way that we've interpreted that is that there is a full existing conditions analysis, a scope of restoration developed to bring the building up to first class sound condition. <laughs> and then a, a, the applicant um, needs to develop an, a cyclical maintenance plan that would bind all owners into the future uh, to maintain the building in that condition. And, and it sets up cyclical inspection schedules. 
And then the um, second finding that the commission needs to make and to support the request to city planning is that the uh, bulk waivers that they are seeking result in a building whose height mass relation siting uh, has a harmonious relationship to the landmark. And so, uh, you know, when there are bulk waivers that push it away from the landmark, that's something that the commission has found to have a harmonious relationship or that the um, simple, the, the simple massing without setbacks make, makes uh, results in a harmonious relationship rather than a building with multiple setbacks that may compete with the, the landmark. I mean, those are the kinds of findings that I, and I'm not speaking directly to this proposal, but just to give you a sense of the kind of findings we have, to, uh, we we make when we are looking at that harmonious relationship. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Ginsburg. Yeah, I, I just wanted to find out a little more about both for the renovation of the church and the new building, what energy low carbon work was planned or was any planned? So uh, Commissioner Ginsburg, this is, I can take that one. So um, so this will be 100% affordable, which means we'll be getting financing from HPD and HDC. And I think as you know, through your work, uh, at a minimum, we'll be doing enterprise green communities. Um, the new building itself will be 100% uh, electric <clears throat> and will on the roof portions, although it's not really evident from the rendering, there would be um, a solar panel array as well. Uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the existing church, I mean, the majority of the, the restoration work doesn't sort of fall under um, having a carbon footprint per se, but um, any new mechanicals, um, that go that supply heat and hot water to the existing church. We'd also look to be high efficiency uh, heat pump boilers. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, and I should add too, as you may know, we'll probably be utilizing Intis um, for all the glazing. Which uh, I don't know if you've used them before, but they're uh, you know pretty high performance but cost effective. Uh, I you know. know them well. Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Lutfi, please go ahead. Um, can you just tell us what the height and bulk of this building is relative to the buildings, the tall residential buildings around it? So using this rendering as a reference, the governor's houses uh, mm -hmm. to the west, uh, west are both 21 stories. We're 21, we're proposing a 21 story. Um, the two buildings closest to the FDR on the other side of the Vladic Homes, I believe those are 26 stories. Um, and then further down the block is an existing six or seven story school. And then you have the, the co-ops a couple blocks over, which I think are uh, around 20 stories. Okay, thank you. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question about the composition. So the, the church is the dominant element in this composition. And um, the idea that you're using is spiraling. You're spiraling up to this tower. And, and I'm wondering, at the end of the day, is the church a dominant thing or is the tower a dominant thing? The tower doesn't seem to be a background building. It's, a, it's almost like a foreground building. So how, how, how do you explain, if the church is supposed to be dominant, how do you see the spiraling concept and the foreground? Right, sure. Um, I could answer that, being the originator of the spiral idea. The spiral idea is not particularly evident from Henry Street. Um, and that was very deliberate. Um, the spiral idea was a way to integrate the tower and the base or that brick portion uh, in a more interesting urbanistic way in a better composition, but as evident from Madison Street. We did not want it that complexity to compete with the, comp the composition of the church as foreground. And we really do see the north face uh, of the tower evident in this image 
as a kind of backdrop because of its kind of plainness. It's, it's very deliberate lack of uh, intricacy, so to speak. Um, so we did see the church in this image as being dominant. Um, but then to integrate this tower better into the local neighborhood as perceived from Madison is where that spiral really manifests it itself and becomes visible. Um, and that was a very important distinction between these two major facades. One is almost like a scrim, a kind of a stage backdrop to a very highly textured, articulate um, historic treasure. The other being much more responsive to the urban conditions around it. For example, the six and seven story uh, NYCHA buildings directly across the street uh, to better integrate the tower with that condition. So they were, you know, very, very deliberate decisions on both major facades uh, of the building. Um, again, the spiral notion is really evident from the South, not from this, uh, from Henry, Henry Street. Did so, I so, so answer your question? Think, just to, just to, I, I hear you when I, I see that. So from this view, yeah. this, the, the church is dominant from this view, from other views. It's not dominant, it becomes subordinate or tertiary. But only from this side, from this angles, the church yeah. is dominant. Is that I, I think that's true. And also other views have shown the tower to be unusually narrow. Why? Because we had we felt we needed to keep at least 30 feet, which is a very standard kind of rear yard dimension. And then the rest of the site minus the 30 feet ended up with a very narrow sliver. If you look at some of the aerial views of this proposal compared with other towers, it's really thin almost like the UN uh, Secretariat building. Um, and actually, that's one of the features I like most about its, its, its slenderness. Um, and it's, you know, it, yes, it's 21 stories, but it's kind of as delicate a 21 story tower as, as can be, uh, rather than a square floor plan or something that's much more bulky, like those Gouverneur towers uh, to the West. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay. Other questions? All right, let's move to public testimony and see if we have anyone here to testify on this item. If you'd like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We received a few signups beforehand for this item, so we'll be hearing from them. Our first signup is Richard Moses from Lesby. So Richard Moses, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Richard Moses, president of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. Regarding the C of A and 74711 application, we completely support the restoration work as outlined as it repairs significant conditions and restores missing historic features. As you know, this church is one of the Lower East Side's treasured landmarks. It was so recognized in 1966 uh, when it was one of the earliest designated landmarks in New York City. In general, we're not opposed to the planned 21 story tower behind the church as the concept of a new building on the property is actually indicated in LPC's designation report. We find the overall design of the building to be appropriate and that it is set back away from the primary facades, will not damage any of the church's original features, mm. and has a design for the base that harmonizes well with the historic church. However, we believe that a shorter building would be more sympathetic with the church and with the neighboring six-story Vladic houses. Nevertheless, as a practicality, the current project may require the 21-story height. We believe though that more can be done to lessen the impact of the tower on the church and the neighborhood. Specifically, the tower is shown with either a very light gray or off-white color. We think it's more of an off-white color cladding that attracts undue attention to itself as a backdrop to the church. The tower's color palette should defer more to that of the church and or its surroundings in this Lower East Side neighborhood. Finally, it's important that current plans include a reasonable level of funding 
for long-term maintenance of the church as part of the provisions of the 74711 application. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC generally supports the goals of this project, including the new affordable housing and community facilities, as well as the proposed restoration of the church that would happen with the approval of the 74711. However, we find the bulk and scale of the proposed residential building to be profoundly out of context for this site. The massing simply overwhelms the church. We believe that a larger floor plate could allow for a shorter, more dense building. We also don't see any relationship between the design of the new building and the existing church's architecture and materiality. We would note that on page six of this application, the applicant has cited laudable examples of appropriately scaled residential architecture on church property, but the citing of those is different than the application for 290 Henry Street, and those structures don't rise to the height of this one. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Jeremy Woodoff from Victorian Society of New York. So Jeremy Woodoff, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Jeremy Woodoff for the Victorian Society of New York. The section 74711 special permit requires a preservation plan. And there is much about that in the presentation material. But there's also a requirement that the proposed use and bulk modifications enhance the harmonious relationship between the landmark and the new building. We can't comment on this because we could find no information on how the modifications of use or bulk being requested enhance this relationship, as opposed to merely enabling construction of the new building. But the real issue here is that the new building is in fact an addition to the church located fully on the landmark site. Therefore, for the new building to be approved, it must be found appropriate in the same way that any proposed addition to an individual landmark must be found appropriate. In that regard, it utterly fails. The proposed residential tower is an example of IBM punch card architecture. Oddly enough, it takes as its modernist stylistic reference, the 1961 annex proposed for demolition. We note that the slogan of the IBM Corporation since at least the 1920s is think. And we know also that the architecture firm that designed the proposed punch card tower is called Think Architecture. An amazing coincidence, a sly inside joke, we don't know. But either way, the proposed building is neither appropriate to nor harmonious with the church. The building is oppressively featureless. The anodized aluminum and cement fiberboard cladding are cheesy beside the fine historic materials and details of the church. The slab overwhelms, minimizes, and miniaturizes the landmark. Banality next to beauty detracts from both. The preservation plan is detailed and extensive, but the full HABS visual documentation should be provided. Most of the proposed work seems necessary and appropriate, but we wonder about the tower balustrade and whether it ever existed without a spire and whether the tower's masonry has been reduced in height a spire would help call attention away from any new building behind it. We oppose installing new aluminum windows in the monumental Gothic openings. These windows will not approach the character of wood windows. The muntins are too shallow and hundreds of metal spacers will be visible when looking up at them. The existing aluminum and colored glass windows from 1961 at least have some age and history. According to the report, the church would prefer to restore them, yet the proposal calls for replacement. Why? Restoration of the existing windows or replacement with accurately detailed wood sash are the two appropriate options. Interior secondary sash can be installed for energy conservation. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thanks so much for your testimony. I am looking through the attendees list now and I do not see any further hands raised. 
So I will note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 3 recommends conditional approval so long as the applicants work with LPC to provide a tower facade design that includes a certain level of depth in the window reveals and shadow lines to provide a texture that harmonizes with the historic building and that LPC assures that there are there will be adequate funding for the continuing maintenance of the historic church. We also received a letter of recommendation from New York Landmark Conservancy as well. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Great, thank you very much. So I'd like to turn back to the applicant team and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Uh, so uh, this is Jack, the co-developer. So I'll actually my comments would be to the sort of first two um, commentators is that you know this project is a is a very well def well defined equation in that. Um, the goal from the outset was maximizing the amount of affordable housing that the site could provide without requesting any uh, additional FAR. Um, we did look at alternate scenarios um, with shorter buildings and squatter buildings. And I'm also trained as an architect. So even before we brought Think on board, um, we've done a fair amount of feasibility study in collaboration with HPD uh, to make sure that it financially made sense. And unfortunately, none of them did. Um, and so the, the project we're presenting today and the design of the new building um, really is a, it's a careful equation that we've been working on for the last two and a half years to ensure that it is financially feasible um, and is also working within the confines of the existing zonings in the 74711 process. Um, and then I would just one kind of response to Victorian society. So <laughs> in defense of Think Architects, um, you know, I've been working in affordable housing for almost 15 years now. I'm also an architect by training. And, you know, I would say that things uh, work to date and the totality of their portfolio, particularly the, the kind of design forward work they've been doing in affordable housing is quite commendable. And it's actually the reason that I hired them for this project. Um, this is a difficult business um, to, to be in, in terms of finding a, a careful equation or a careful balance between cost and design. And think, you know, in his previous projects has routinely met that challenge. And that's why I'm excited and proud to have them be the architect for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, and I, I think, uh, Jack, I can jump in to answer the second uh, aspect of, um, uh, of the Victorian Society's questions about the windows. And um, my name is Egbert Stolk. I'm the director of Diocesan Property Services, and I work on the Bishop's staff. Uh, and I help the church um, get the approval of the standing committee and the bishop, uh, which also has a similar to you, a set of requirements uh, to approve a development. Um, so the type, the type of window, in this case, we looked at both wood and aluminum, but it's driven by the maximum budget of the restoration work that's feasible for the church without endangering the financial consideration to the church. Each church within the Episcopal Diocese is self-funding. Um, so it has to uh, uh, make sure that uh, each, each parish uh, can afford their own maintenance. Um, that consideration to the church as part of this uh, uh, development is key and will 100% fund the long-term operations and the maintenance of the church as required by our di diocesan guidelines for approval by the Bishop and Standing Committee. Uh, we wanna make sure that in 25 years, we're not in the same position and these guidelines are fairly new. Um, Mission-driven real estate, which we also support, uh, mostly includes affordable housing, um, but it has put further limitations on the financial buffers the church has for this project. Um, we try to create a, a financial balance that will ensure the survival of this important diocesan black church, of which we are losing many of them because of the financial burdens of their operations and maintenance of their buildings. In particular, in COVID and um, with the inflation of restoration costs. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, would anyone like to address the comments about the um, bulk waivers and how they create a harmonious relationship or to the height design or materials of the new building? Uh, Chair Carroll, I also have an additional question in terms of the testimony from the uh, village preservation. I think that there was a comment about 
uh, the material being a lighter color, uh, uh, that if it's the darker color, it may draw less attention. So I'd love to hear the applicant's response to that. Thank yes. you. Um, yeah, I can speak to that uh, it, it, okay. because it, it was certainly not a random choice, of, of course. And um, I look at buildings against the sky all the time, every day. Um, my perception is that buildings of a lighter tone against the sky actually create more of a sense of weightlessness and lightness. And that was our thinking that, that we were want, not a building to go away. It won't, it won't go away, but we wanted it to have to be skewed towards the lighter. So it would perhaps blend in with the sky and have less of a heaviness. I think a darker tower would bring more attention to, to itself and less attention to the church. It was very deliberate. Now we could, we could certainly look at how dark a tan or a gray. And I, I think it should skew light, but may, maybe it could be a, a bit darker. I, I think that's a level of detail. We submitted a tone we thought was good, um, but we certainly could look at darker tones, but I wouldn't go very, a lot darker. I think that would create more attention. It would make the tower have a greater presence against the sky and more competitive to the church. I, I'm, I'm really quite, I feel quite strongly about that. Okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner sure. Lutfi. So to the question of maintaining the, uh, maintaining the, the church over the years, isn't there normally, or am I recalling this incorrectly, isn't there normally a budget attached to this that the developer funds, in part, at least in part? Mark, why don't you jump in and just talk a little bit about the structure that we generally see and how that is uh, being played out here? Right. So that that's... Uh... I think Commissioner Lucky's question is slightly different than that. She's asking about the, the the sort of upfront restoration and what and what the uh, uh, developers no, fund. But I'll but I'll just talk briefly. There was a testimony about this question about a fund for um, uh, uh, sort of funding the continuing maintenance program for you know a while after the special permit. And typically, that is, these that is what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. So so that is. Um, so when there's a sale uh, or it's a completely unrelated thing, then that makes sense to make sure that there is a dedicated fund because they're getting a one-time you know, infusion of cash. Um, this is a, a ground lease. They're going to be getting rent over time. Um, and so the, the obligation is, of course, something that is triggered over time. And because they'll be getting this rent over time, uh, there's no real need to sort of require them to keep anything, you know, to have this sort of um, uh, to put aside X percent because they're going to be getting rent, you know, every year or whatever. And so they'll be, they'll have the money to fund this as it comes forward. The legal obligation remains, you know, that nothing changes about that. They have the legal obligation to do this work. Okay. And um, commissioner, if I could just add to that, there will also be an upfront um, cash component to um, the business terms with, so that would allow us for St. Augustine, to pay for the restoration scope that Michael had outlined today. Okay. Does it fully cover it? Yes. Okay. And then I have another question. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So obviously, I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of thinking and work surrounding the restoration. And uh, I mean, there's so many details here that, um, you know, we can't review right now. Sarah, could you explain how this review process actually works so that the, so that, you know, the devils are in the details and, and how, so that the details of everything, every component of this project are going to be executed um, to the highest standards I, so, so mo most of the restoration work will be approved at staff level. So the staff will be going through all of the details and the specifications and 
um, reviewing that very carefully. So we're really looking at the scope and whether we think the scope is sufficient. And then there are within that a couple of components of the restoration work that we are reviewing. And one is the balustrade on the top. Of, so the, historically, the church had um, a steeple, I believe. And then they, there is a historic drawing that shows the balustrade. But we don't have any photographic evidence that it actually ever uh, existed at the time the steeple was there. So that's one question that's before the commission because we don't have the documentation for that. The um, other component is the window replacement that's being proposed, which wouldn't be eligible for a staff level permit because these windows would have to match uh, the materials as well as profiles and details of the historic windows to be eligible for a staff level permit. Um, and then, uh, Corey, is there any other restoration component that I'm missing at the moment right now? Yeah, I, and I'm not sure it was uh, discussed widely, if at all, but there, there's also the issue of the roofing, currently an asphalt shingle roofing, which had been replaced uh, at some point in the past without LPC review. And I believe the current plan is to keep that. It's still very serviceable and has life left uh, in it. And then in the future, when it needs to be replaced, uh, to work with staff on um, something that better recalls the historic wood shingle roofing. Um, the side yard uh, where the sort of uh, at um, sorry the ADA entrance is being incorporated with the bluestone paving and the planters in the area way, also not restorative work, but part of the commission level review. Uh, in addition, right. Okay. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Chu. All right, last question. Um, again, with the with the restoration work on the church with and the proposal of the balustrade around, was it not ever considered to to with some of the historic records we have to rebuild the spire? Because I feel like with the big addition of the tower behind, I look at this building and I wish there was actually you know, the original focus of that spire and that church to complete the picture. And so my eye doesn't go so much to the tower behind, <laughs> but mm -hmm. that's a question for the applicant, if that was considered. So I can, I can take that question. And and the answer is yes, we, we did consider that in the beginning. Um, what we ultimately determine is re really the the belfry is from a later date it's from 1881 the architecture of the belfry was very different it was a high victorian gothic style compared to this georgian late federal style um also just as with with the windows the habs documentation or the documentation that we have of the belfry is very limited it's not very detailed and we felt there wasn't significant or a sufficient amount of, of detail to use to reconstruct the tower appropriately or, or correctly um, and so um, also segueing into why we ultimately landed on the 1848 appearance or the date of significance is that's what we felt made this church different from other churches. There's plenty of Victorian churches in, in New York City. Um, and really, we felt it was this earlier period um, that was more significant than the later alterations uh, that were done in the Victorian period in 1874 and 1881. And then subsequently in 1961. So the idea was to return this to its earliest appearance. And I don't know if you want to just quickly walk through the historic photos to show what the change is. Oh, sure. Um, James, if you can. Yep. Uh, so to the, to the left here, which is the, the 1940 tax photo, we do see that, that steeple, um, of course, it was a wood and, and slate steeple, again, in the high Victorian Gothic style. Um, so in, in the 1870s and then the 18, in 1881, the church was, was really transformed from a late federal style appearance more to um, a, Victor a Victorian aesthetic with the new stained glass uh, diamond paned windows the, and, and then the introduction of the, the, the belfry. James, if you go to the next slide, please, or a couple more slides, um, one more, uh, one further. 
Thank you. So this is this is the really the rendering, which we believe comes from from 1881, and we believe it was it was probably prepared for when the 1881 restor or renovation was was being proposed. Um, and yes, this is the only known image of the balustrade. Though, if we are to believe the historic American documentation. Um, it, it states that there was a balustrade assembly and the description in, in the HAPS documentation is that the balustrade assembly had um, a center and corner posts, which we do see in the rendering. Um, okay. It's possible that the person writing the HAPS documentation had also seen this rendering. Um, however, this was something we found from the Episcopal Diocese. Uh, it took a lot of digging to find it, but at least we know from the, the HAPS documentation and this rendering that the, the, at least the two uh, correspond with each other in terms of the description and the design. Um, and then really okay. the only basis for the wood windows as well as the is the HABS documentation. Um, there is there are, as far as we know, no known photographs of that last remaining wood triple hung window that was there in 1934. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah, Chair Carroll, how do we evaluate the bulk report? Um, you know, the courtyard, minimum distances, all that. How do we evaluate that? If we like the project as is, we can approve it and say these issues are fine. Right. So we're, yeah, and we're not exactly evaluating those bulk waivers. City planning will do that after they work through a process with us. Those zoning waivers will be reviewed by city planning, but we have to find that the zoning waivers result in a harmonious relationship to the between the new construction and the yeah. the individual part. And so, Mark, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to describe that. No, I mean, the city planning wants our opinion on it, obviously, and and but ultimately they will be making those decisions. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. So, so if we approve this, we're approving everything else, right? Yeah. We say it's harmonious. Therefore, okay. Thank you. Right. I mean, it, it's a. We have often um, looked at proposals to uh, do a new building off the landmark site next to an individual landmark using the same uh, section 74, 711 of the zoning resolution, and we've had to um, evaluate whether those bulk waivers related uh, resulted in a harmonious relationship. This particular application, we're doing two things on this building. We're looking at how, whether or not the new building and the, the connector are appropriate. And then we are also looking to see if the bulk waivers result in a harmonious relationship. Thank you, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, so maybe we should close the hearing and begin our discussion. So I'm gonna ask you all to unmute. And Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen, second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion now. And, and I think yes, I've so said I, a few just, times uh, that it's up there. The two uh, applications for a certificate of appropriateness for the um, removal of the 1961 annex, the construction of the new building and link, the pathway, the ADA pathway in, um, connector, and the replacement windows and the balustrade and the roofing. The second application is that requesting that LPC support their application at the City Planning Commission. And we need to make a finding that the scope of work and the um, intended cyclical maintenance plan, um, which would be in, and they would enter into a restrictive declaration uh, with this cyclical maintenance plan that would require it to be maintained in perpetuity. And whether those the restoration work and the scope of the restoration work, which will be ultimately reviewed by staff, and that cyclical maintenance that restorate uh, that restrictive declaration um, result in a preservation purpose. And then, uh, as I said, we'd also have to find that there's a harmonious relationship. So, two applications. You can start with 
the appropriateness questions and then um, move to the um, questions about the preservation purpose and the harmonious relationship, if that's easier for you. All right. And, and, you know, and I, I would just also start out by saying that we do have, um, you know, a number of religious properties that are designated either as individual landmarks and within <clears throat> historic districts. And we do also know that many of those uh, religious institutions are um, struggling with similar, con you know, shared concerns of often dwindling congregations and very complex buildings mm -hmm. that uh, require uh, expertise and special and unique um, approaches to their maintenance and restoration, and um, and also the sort of balancing of priorities of mission and preserving the building. And so we um, we work closely with these religious institutions to help them achieve that balance. And I think that this application is reflective of this particular um, church trying to find that balance. So we'll begin our discussion now. Commissioner Bland, would you like to start this one? Oh, I really would. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the more I listened to this, uh, the more excited I got. Ultimately, become became quite thrilled by the whole um, opportunity that I think the commission has here. Um, maybe not to approve this exactly as it is, but, but the commission has an opportunity now here uh, to have this project be a model for how what you've just said can be implemented. As we all know, occasionally the LPC and preservationists in general are taking it on the chin these days for not, you know, for thwarting development, for thwarting density, for thwarting uh, new housing, particularly in a new affordable housing in, in our city and other cities as well. So if we can get this right, to me, it represents um, one of the biggest challenges that um, our city has, which are all these landmark churches and, and many other churches that are not landmark, but still exhibit dwindling congregations. And what do we do with these things? You know, these are extraordinarily important um, elements of our of our streetscape and our and our communities that we can't allow them to to, to leave us. So how do they, how do they stay? Um, anyway, that's our challenge. But to me, this represents um, a way out of it. Um, as I said, the more I listened to the architects explain um, what was uh, how they were uh, dealing with this issue, a, a thorny issue of putting a 21 story building right behind, you know, a, 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 sh a much shorter and uh, a 200 year old or earlier uh, church building. Um, <clears throat> of course, this issue is not new to us. We have approved uh, uh, recently to, to, some, to some view it as inappropriate, but uh, I voted for it each time, an 80 story building next to a bank in Brooklyn. Uh, couple of, you know, super talls uh, on landmark sites uh, along 57th Street. Uh, everybody can come to their own conclusions on what, what all that means. But this is not the first time that we're seeing a tall building um, on a landmark site um, adjacent to um, a, a much shorter and much older building. Um, <clears throat> so, what I'm trying to do here is not to dwell on all the little issues, but to frame, at least for me, the big issue, the big challenge, and the great opportunity I think LPC has to use this as a model uh, for other for other uh, other uh, such um, opportunities around around the city, and to show the to show us to, to show the city that we're in the real world that we can really help solve this problem, not obstruct it. Now, a few, a few thoughts, and only a few. Um, for, first of all, I will say, uh, I said earlier this morning, when, when you learn something every day, well, uh, that was in the morning, but in the afternoon, uh, I learned that this was one of Trinity's, uh, I think nine, or was it 10, um, original chapels throughout the city. Well, guess what? I was a vestryman at Trinity Church for 15 years and never knew 
that this church was one of those chapels. So with my head in the sand, perhaps, I don't know, but uh, what a revelation. In any event, <clears throat> I also oversaw from an owner's point of view, the, the, the vestry point of view, uh, an incredibly expensive 70-year-long, uh, 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 def uh, deferred for 70 years, renovation of Trinity Church, which I think most of the commission knows about, and I hope many of you have gone to see the extraordinary results. So I know the costs of doing such a job, and I must say I'm a little worried about the extraordinary um, list of of, um, of restoration items that was outlined by the Lee Holtzman uh, architect. Um, I hope it all can be done. Uh, we've heard that it will be done and it will be funded. I just hope that's true. Um, in any event, that's a, that's a hope. I'm not gonna um, opine much on all of that because I think so much of it is either staff level uh, or working with staff to get it right. To me, the balustrade, however it comes about, through, uh, through um, evidence that it was once there or, or was once planned to be there, it seems like a right way and a, and a relatively inexpensive way of capping what, what seems to be, uh, you know, a, a lopped off um, top of, of the church. And so this seems appropriate to me. Regarding the, um, uh, the once shingled, wood shingled, did I hear? Uh, roof, uh, it seems to me to be appropriate to leave it as it as uh, asphalt shingles for the rest of its useful life. Um, the windows are another issue. I think we have to look at that more carefully. Will that come back to us? It was a little unclear on that. Or, or are we dealing with that right now? Uh, Sarah, you're you're muted. We are we are uh, asking you all to uh, opine on that right now. All right now, okay. Um, I'm a little nervous about about uh, the, the um, you know aluminum window uh, out of a catalog, basically, even if it's custom, makes me a little nervous. Um, that's the, the the renovation issues that I want to deal with. I think there are some other ones, but I'll let others talk about it because I'm talking too long anyway. Um, regarding the new building, um, again, I thought when I first saw this picture, it was kind of inappropriate, but the more I listened, the more I understood what's happening architecturally. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to separate that from socially, which I described at great length in the beginning. Um, I, th I thought the architect did a very good job of, of um, defining the way by which this very thin building, which he equated at one point to the secretariat at the UN, which I've always admired too, particularly when you see it from that angle. Um, I think it's a han very handsome building. Um, and I think the back of it, which has been um, divided in that interesting way um, is, is interesting as well. I must say, even though I heard the architect go on about <clears throat> and dig deeper into the fact that it shouldn't be darker, um, I think it should be darker, you know? We're all told when you get a little heavy, don't wear a white suit, go for a black suit uh, or dark suit. Well, it might apply here too. So um, maybe a little bit darker, I think might be appropriate. So um, uh, otherwise we're seeing mostly windows, which I think most buildings, <laughs> high rise buildings do, do um, exhibit. So that's not an unusual thing. I think the whole relationship at the base was very, very, very well done. And I liked that quite a bit. So I've gone on too long. Let me, let me feed my, my floor to others so they can speak too. <clears throat> Thank you very much for those uh, thoughtful comments. And um, one thing I also wanted to add, and I ne neglected to say this before I kicked it off, um, and maybe this is a good time to mention it anyway, that that uh, one of the this was a very early designation. It was designated yeah. in 1966, and I think even at that time, the commission recognized that religious institutions have unique needs and challenges. And the designation report, this designation report for this church 
specifically states that the designation is not intended to freeze the structure in its present state or prevent or to prevent future appropriate alterations. Uh, and the commission recognized that the parish might want to construct new buildings on the landmark site. So, you know, it is something that I think even in 1966, the commission recognized was sort of a reality of finding that balance. Um, so that's just a note. We'll move on. Commissioner Chu, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you. Um, okay. So. I do, I'm just going to go through the list. I agree with much of, of what uh, Commissioner Bland had just said. I do think this is a great opportunity to restore this landmark um, and otherwise would be very, very challenging for the church to be able to, to, to do this. Um, I think that the removal of the annex makes sense. I do appreciate the narrowing of the, I'll call it the neck, the connector. I, I do see great value in, in exposing that those corners that were, were buried previously. So I commend the architect and the, the planners on looking at that. Um, I also think that the side court is a great improvement to what's there right now. And it has good adjacency, the programming to put a, a room over to the side off of it, I think makes sense. I do question the size of it, but I think in terms of location and adjacency, um, it it's an improvement to the existing structure that was glommed onto that last window there. Um, let's see, the pallet and the mass of the tower. Um, so. Considering what uh, Chair Carroll just, just mentioned about the initial notes on the, the, the landmark status in the 60s here, um, and considering our current uh, situation and the need for housing throughout the city, it, it sort of paints a different picture from what may have been assumed even back then. Um, housing is definitely something we need. Um, and in terms of height, it is big. Uh, but it does look like there is contextual scale large mass. I do appreciate the thinness of the tower. I do agree with the architect in that sense. Um, from certain views, it will appear less massive because it is thin. And keeping it thin, thin is a good thing. Um, the color and the materials for economy, I understand that cement board was chosen as the cladding material. Um, I understand that is a big cost issue, how we clad these, these, these buildings. I just want to make sure that the final color is looked at closely with the staff as well, and really looking at it with the samples and in front of the existing building materials. I do think that the general approach and palette is acceptable to me, that the tones do seem to be complementary. Um, I can see that there's a, a, an accent around that large glass window that in some ways tries to bring back the color of the brick around the windows. That detail, I think, can be reviewed further with staff, making sure it has articulation and not too flat and chunky looking. I think in general, those are the things I'm looking at, especially are the elements that really do look to me to be a companion to the church, which is that small two-story element. The tower to me is a separate piece. It's, it could be almost on a separate block. And I know that that was the intent and that was what was imagined. I do agree that the simplicity and not bringing the twist around here was a good thing. It does feel more <laughs> monotonous in some ways, but I can see that maybe more as a potential backdrop to, to the church. Um, the balustrade and the the uh, uh, my previous comment about the lack of steeple there, um, I do wish it was there. I, I will make that. I understand that there's economic challenges. There's already a very hefty scope on restoring the rest of the church, but I do think that that would have added something really to, to the crowning element, because I do see the tower great behind it. And I want the church to come back to its sense of height, that now the tower is going so high, I wish the church could reach up to like it used to. 
and therefore feel like in some ways a companion vertically or an expression to the tower. Those are my comments. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Jefferson. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> let me start with the demolition of the parish house, appropriate. Alter the area way, it works very well. I think altering it makes sense. Installing the balustrade, it, it, it adds so much, it makes it better than, it felt bald before and now it feels complete. Uh, installing lighting, also appropriate. Uh, replace windows, the issue with aluminum and wood, that would be worked out. My only issue, which I applaud the architect in a way, and I applaud the architect because the, the, the composition of the church and the tower, the only thing that I think is missing is that they seem to be, they should be almost the same color. So when I look at this, I see a composition of a, rect a rectilinear form, slim, tight, and a church kind of a, with a different form and two things living together that I can see as one. And right now it doesn't, there, it's a contrast between the light one and the dark one. If it wasn't a contrast, it would come together the composition. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. So as you said, this, this is not the first time we've seen a project like this. Um, and they're, you know, for better or for worse, they're very, very important projects because in this, sometimes, sometimes they create uh, market rate housing in this particular, and, and they're taller. And in this instance, they're creating affordable housing, which, you know, is very important in, uh, is a very important need in the city's landscape. Um, so, and, and these projects do do serve a purpose in helping these um, these historic architectural treasures to be restored, and it is very very exciting. All, all the work that's being done here is very very exciting. I am a little nervous about the details, and I hope you know, as I said, and you said, the staff will be working with them very very closely. Um, I, you know, I look forward to seeing it whenever it's done, and I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. I happen to agree um, with uh, Commissioner uh, Chu that you know the it is unfortunate that the belfry is not going to be restored in some way. Um, I mean, I. I I just, uh, I think no matter what happens here, it, it the the balustrade is a way to solve the problem, but the the it's it's the the crown the jewel at the top really makes a difference with this project. And if there was any way to to get it in into this scope of work, it would be wonderful. Um, I'm. Um, of, of, of course, a, a, approve and think um, that removing the annex makes sense. Um, it makes sense, you know, to work with the existing shingles until their useful life is um, done. And then uh, new ones can be on the roof and, and the and new ones can take their place. Um, I... I actually like this uh, small building to the side because I I almost feel like it's a um, it's a connector between the church and the the architecturally speaking and and the uh, housing building they're on the same campus so there's uh, I think it's you know, disingenuous for us to completely separate them. They're, they're together. 
And the reason why the building is tall is because there's just not enough land to do buildings that are um, shorter. And in truth, in the greater scheme of things, 20 stories in this particular setting doesn't seem too big to me. There are, even though the NYCHA housing is much, much smaller in the background, there are other taller buildings in the surrounding area. And I, and I um, so I'm fine with the height. And I appreciate the design of the building because it's simple. And I do think it's kind of, I do think it's kind of elegant. And I, I feel that the architect has been very thoughtful in terms of how um, he and his firm have like sort of, I, I almost laced the pieces together in, in a, a lovely way in, in terms of a color and shape and, um, I don't know, works very well. I, I like the fact that it's a lighter color. I, I think it should be explored though, because sometimes uh, lighter colors don't really age well, but I I do agree that it, it kind of recedes into the skyline, into the sky. And I think I think that's a good thing. I do think the gesture on the back, this, that little step might've been very nice on the front, but... Um, Instead, it's uh, and it and it kind of uh, would have worked with the church because of the way the church building steps up. But um, I think this is fine. I am also um, a little concerned about the windows uh, that they are going to be aluminum instead of uh, um, wood clad windows, and I. Uh, would like to recommend that the staff pay close close attention to that. And um, I don't know if I left anything out, Sarah. I think you got everything. Okay. I think you got everything. Thank you. Yeah, right. I think it's Ginsburg. I think it's exciting. Great, Commissioner Ginsburg. Come on. Thank you. Gotta get off. A mute. I, I first want to say I think it was a very thoughtful and detailed presentation, and I agree with many of my commissioners, particularly Commissioner Bland, on how this may be or this is seemingly a very good solution to uh, the problem that many churches in New York have. And so, number of things. First of all, I think getting rid of the annex and exposing the corner is a real gain uh, for the church. Um, I actually don't, and I realize this gets to be a very personal opinion, but this pictures of the steeple seem like they're at, it was glommed on to a building. So I prefer it with the balustrade and no steeple. <laughs> uh, and I realize that's not in total agreement with uh, everyone else. Um, let me see, uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, I think also one of the things that becomes important is they need to be 30 feet away from the church. They need some set setback on the other, other street and they get to 55 feet, which is about as narrow as you can go and make an efficient apartment building plan. And I think the balance they've done is good is good and that the scale given that there are other buildings in the neighborhood that are this high it is fine um and, and then uh so that then leaves uh the two other issues i want to address the color where it might be good to see some studies of a slightly darker light gray to see how that looks but it does i'm i I'm worried that a darker gray is going to actually make it look heavier and more on, ominous. And just to point out that the fiber cement cladding is more expensive than brick from my experience. But one of the big advantages, it's a thinner composite. And given that they are doing a narrow building, 
gaining those six or eight inches is really important for keeping the usable space. And I think that makes sense to me. And I think with that, in, uh, oh, the aluminum windows on the church, I think they're fine and they may actually, given the size, be easier to do than the wood windows. But I realize others of the commission, or, commission have different opinions on that. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, so I uh, I share many of the sentiments for, for the comments from the other commissioners. Um, it is, uh, you know, to, to Vice Chair uh, Blant's point, uh, you know, I'm also uh, been blessed to work with the Trinity Church on the uh, advisory council. And, uh, and uh, this is the first I heard of that this is uh, the uh, that this is one of the original ones. And, and so we do learn something new every day. Um, I also uh, agree with Commissioner Ginsburg that because this uh, church has been sitting there uh, for so long that I'm getting used to the balustrade, um, you know, that rather than the belfry, I remember the uh, the other uh, uh, recently during a storm where the, the church belfry fell on Main Street in Queens. Uh, so at the additional cost of maintenance, given the burden of the religious organizations to maintain a, additional, uh, 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 you know, so that, that's that's my personal thought, uh, my personal thinking. Uh, and also, I, I, I think that I also like the, the comment about the approach that the, first of all, I, I also agree that, that the applicant has thought, uh, thoughtful, uh, um, um, is a, a, a thoughtful uh, comparison between a squatter building. I, I think to the degree, given the limitation of the site. Uh, guys, I'm on a hearing, please. Um, that uh, the, uh, the 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 analysis of a squatter building, I think, given the constraint of the site, I think the uh, the 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 it is a a a better. And I agree with the other comments about how well the base is working. Uh, you know the, uh, the 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 new way that they have approached it. Uh, this is very well done. Um, you know, in terms of the, the reason I mentioned the comment, uh, I, I listened to the testimony about the lighter color. It, our human eyes tend to draw to brighter color items. So I, 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 I actually did a Google test while the testimonies are going on with the Google map to walk around the neighborhood. And I think the rendering, as good as the presentation, it did, it didn't the justification for this project. Because in the context from the street view, walking around the neighborhood and taking a look at this project, I think the rendering sort of essentially uh, suggests is, is, is high height, but when in fact is quite contextual to the surrounding. Uh, so, um, and, and lighter color tend to draw your eye. And so uh, I leave it to the commissioner to decide uh, whether you want to have a, um, a mock-up test of the, and leave it to our, our uh, excellent staff to look at a color where the, uh, it should be a slightly darker shade as I think the, um, the architect is, is, um, uh, has a conviction to, to what he's proposing. Uh, but overall, I think this is a great um, model to study. For example, um, you know, I was in Harlem recently looking at how a new, to Jeannie's point, uh, a new uh, market rate housing was built right next to a church. And there was no such thing as the buffering, the the the, uh, the room that is uh, the distance that is, is, is shared. So I think that um, in a way this is a, a long time coming, and I think this is will be a good example, especially given that it is um, the affordable housing that is so badly needed in the city right now. All right, great, thank you, and Commissioner Master. Um, yes, I share a lot of um, the other commissioner's sentiments, um, in particular, um, Commissioner Bland's enthusiasm for this project. Um, I think it's wonderful that we um, are able to get affordable housing. Um, in addition, we're also getting the much needed funds, and I'm sure significant funds, um, to restore this church. I'm sure that the uh, restoration is going to be quite expensive. Um, in terms of the height of the building, I think, as Commissioner Lefty said, there are other buildings in this neighborhood that have similar heights. I don't think it's out of place. Um, 
I actually commend the architect and his team uh, for the thought that they put in uh, to not only the building in the rear, but also the connector and the relationship to the church. I thought it was very thoughtfully done. Um, and in terms of the color of the building, um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't feel strongly uh, one way or the other. Um, as Commissioner Chen had mentioned, maybe you could do a mock-up and a test. Um, maybe they can work with the staff to see what, you know, blends in a little bit better. Um, the balustrade is fine. Um, and let's see. And then the windows, I think I will defer to the other commissioners um, on the windows. I think that's it. Okay. Right? All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, and commissioner, thank you all for your very thoughtful comments and I and and your support for how our individual landmarks can contribute to other social goals, but particularly how this project will support the individual landmark and the restoration of this individual landmark. And so um, I think we can go ahead and make a motion to approve this with the condition that they um, review and uh, that they submit for review and approval by the staff samples of the color in the field that can be looked at both for its um, larger relationship and whether it would call attention away from or not from the church building, but also its relationship to the materiality of the building. I heard both comments from you all. And um, and we can also, if any commissioners are, are uh, interested, we can make that available to you too as well for a site visit. And then the second condition, I think we should, there were some questions about the windows, although I think general support, but I think we would ask that they really work very closely with the staff on those details of those windows to um, get the, the closest approximation they can. So um, I'll go ahead and make the motion for those, uh, those two applications and we'll see where we are. So let me pull that up. Okay, in the first one, yeah, in the matter of docket number uh, LPC 23-03684-290 Henry Street, St. Augustine's Chapel, the, fo uh, the former All Saints Free Church and Individual Landmark, a late federal style church with Georgian Gothic detailing attributed to John Heath built in 1827 to 1829 and later altered and an attached parish house designed by Adams and Woodbridge architects and built in 1961 to 63. This is an application to demolish the parish, parish house and attached mid-use tower, alter the areaway, install a rooftop balustrade and install lighting and replace windows. And I recommend approval of, of the work at the uh, church building with modifications, finding that the designation report specifically states that this designation was not intended to freeze the structure in its present state or to prevent future appropriate alterations. And the commission recognized that the parish might want to construct new buildings on the landmark site and make alterations to the existing buildings in the future. And this proposal is consistent with that uh, intent that the attached parish house built in 1961 to 63 is not a historic or architecturally significant element of the building or site and its demolition will allow certain facades and features of the individual landmark to be re-exposed without resulting in the loss of significant hist any historic features, that the existing aluminum framed pastel colored stained glass window assemblies that were installed in the church's lancet window openings in the 1960s are not significant architectural or historic features for which the building was designated and the removal of these windows will not detract from the building, that the installation of new multi-light double hung aluminum window assemblies simulating triple hung windows with a fixed upper sash and a fixed transom all with clear glazing will recall the original windows as documented in the 1934 HAB survey. 
but the installation of a new wood baluster at the top railing atop the existing flat roofed masonry tower, which is based on a description in, 19, in the 1934 HAB document mentioning the per precursor to the 1881 Victorian Belfry steeple and shown in a circa 1880 woodblock rendering will recall missing historic elements at the flat roof tower and will be in keeping with tower features found on churches of this age and style. That the removal of a non-structural 1960s concrete buttress at the east facade will not eliminate a significant feature, but the existing asphalt roofing that was installed without LPC permits and is visible from public thoroughfares has a neutral presence. It does not detract from the building, and eventually when it wears out, will this new historic wood shingle be reviewed in consultation with LPC staff. That the redesign of the side yard will provide barrier-free access to the new parish house and the basement hall and sanctuary level of the church building and will feature bluestone paving and planting beds, masonry, retaining walls and areaway, simple metal railings and light fixtures that will all be harmonious with the various site features and architectural features of the building space and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the individual landmark. However, I recommend that the applicant continue to work in close consultation with the staff to resolve and fully develop the details of the aluminum windows uh, to ensure a, as close a match to the historic windows as possible. And with regard to the new building, I recommend approval find with uh, modification, well, approval, finding that the original church, which only occupies about half of the through block landmark site has always been situated among a diverse urban context in it's obscured from certain vantage points or seen against a backdrop of larger buildings, that the redevelopment of the rear of the site with a 21-story residential tower plus an additional mechanical floor will be in keeping with the varied nature of the surrounding context, which is filled with low buildings and residential tower complexes, that the new tower, of which only the rear facade will be seen prominently in conjunction with the church, will feature a simple regular regularized grid of cladding and window openings and will serve as a neutral backdrop without visually detracting from the landmark that the various materials of the new tower featuring a warm gray and cream colored GFRC panels and gray finished aluminum windows and the new base connectors and parish house featuring warm gray brick and bronze finished aluminum sandal panels panels windows and other framing will relate harmoniously to the stone masonry and restored finishes of the church building, that the base of the tower and chancel will attach to the church building with glazed connectors that will clearly demark a separation of old and new, that the three-story parish house, which is situated close to the rear of the church and the back of the side yard, will be well scaled to the lower well scaled to and lower than the nave of the church and the vert and the verticality of its window assembly will relate to and harmonize with the landscape windows of the church and that the proposed new building at the rear of the landmark site and connections to the church building will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the individual landmark however i do note that this um, recommendation for approval is contingent upon final review and approval of samples of the color of the cladding material in the field uh, adjacent to the historic building to ensure that it won't detract from the church building and will harmonize with its materiality. Okay, so for that one, Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? <clears throat> Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved and please continue to work with the staff on the finish and the window details. And now we have to make the second motion for the uh, request that we, the Landmarks Commission issue a report to the City Planning Commission related to the request uh, for the special permit under Section 74711. And Commissioner Master, can I ask you to make that motion? 
It would be item number six. You may have just gotten up, judging by the video. Oh, okay. All right, let me see if I can find someone else who can give me a break. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you make that motion? <laughs> I, I'll try and give you a break. Thank you. LPC-23-06783-290 <laughs> Henry Street, <clears throat> AKA 286-292 Henry Street, and 333-343 Madison Street, say Augustine's Chapel, the former All Saints Free Church individual landmark, a late federal style church with Georgian Gothic detailing attributed to John Heath, built in 1827 to 1829 and later altered, and an attached Paris house designed by Adam and Woodbridge architects and built in 1961 to 63, Application is to request that Landmarks Preservation Commission issue a report to the City Planning Commission related to an application for modification of use in bulk pursuant to Section 74-711 of the Zoning Resolution. I note yes, that I this, this application oh, yeah. is being heard in conjunction with the LPC 23-03 684, an application for a certificate of appropriateness to demolish the Paris house and construct an attached mixed use tower, alter the area way, install a rooftop balustrade, install lighting and replace windows. Uh, I find, I recommend that the restorative work be approved at staff level, including masonry repair, cleaning, wood cornice repair, painting, special window restoration, door and light fixture replacement restoration, will restore missing architectural details and return the building closer to the historic appearance in the 19th century. That certain aspects of the additional work to be proposed under LPC 23-03684, including replacing lancet windows, installing a new tower balustrade and future roof replacement will return the building closer to the historic 19th century appearance. That the implementation of cyclical maintenance plan will ensure the continued maintenance of the building in a sound first class condition. That the proposed work will bring the building up to sound first class condition and aid in its long-term preservation. That the height and bulk waivers will allow the proposed new building to read as a separate and distinctive from the histor historic church building and will relate harmoniously with the landmark. And that the owner of the designated building have committed themselves to establishing a cyclical maintenance plan that will be legally enforceable by the Landmarks Preservation Commission under the provisions of the restrictive declaration, which <clears> will <throat> bind all heirs, successors, and then sign, which will be recorded at the New York City County Register's Office. Do I need to note that this approval is pending the work review with the staff of the other nope. issues? Okay. No, then no. I'm done and thank you. Great, thank you. All right, and Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All right, and Mark, will you call the vote? Mark? There. Sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you very much. All right, and so commissioners, it's very late, but we're gonna try to do one more item and <laughs> that will be the final item for the day. And thank you all for your patience. I know some of you may have to drop off. All right, Corey? Yes, and uh, before we do start that last one, I just want to read in several items into the record uh, that we won't get to today, but that we'll bring back to a hearing uh, very soon. Those are items uh, 8 through 11. Uh, item 8, LPC 23-09371-169 Congress Street in Cobble Hill Historic District. Item 9, LPC 
34 Veranda Place in the Cabo Hill Historic District. Item 10, LPC 23-06905, 1 Cambridge Place in the Clinton Hill Historic District. And item 11, LPC 23-03194, 162 Hancock Street in the Bedford Historic District, all read into the record to be presented at a future public hearing date. And we'll conclude with public hearing item number seven, LPC 23-05599, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1166, lot 13, 155 Underhill Avenue in the Prospect Heights Historic District. This is a Renaissance revival, Romanesque revival style row house designed by William H. Reynolds, built circa 1897, and the application is to alter the rear facade, install a rooftop deck and mechanical equipment. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Ramos, you have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. Excellent. And then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record. You may begin. Great. Um, <clears throat> this is Harmaz Batliboy. I am the principal architect at Batliboy Studio. All right. Um, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon or good evening. And uh, thank you, Chair Carol and commissioners. I know this is a long day. I'll try to be as efficient as possible. Um, I'm Harmaz Batliboy, as I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and I'm here on behalf of my clients, um, the McCalla family. They are residents of Prospect Heights. Um, and we are working on their project at uh, 155 Underhill Avenue. So that is in the Prospect Heights Historic District. Um, it is, as previously mentioned, um, built by William H. Reynolds from 1897. Um, it's 155 Underhill, that's a front, um, the front elevation view. Um, it's on Underhill between Sterling and Park Place. And probably most relevant for this conversation uh, and your consideration here is the fact that it's one house in from Park Place, uh, so it's very close to the corner. Um, I know we're short on time, <laughs> so I will quickly give a high level summary of the overall scope, which is a renovation of an existing two family home. Um, there's an owner's triplex above a uh, garden level rental unit. And as part of the work that's related to the owner's triplex is uh, work on the rear facade um, and on the roof. This is the existing section through the building um, showing in the background the building at the corner, 153 Underhill, which has a higher cornice line uh, beyond and also has an existing two-story extension uh, that you see in the lower um, right of the section. Um, <clears throat> there's a photo of the backyard and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and then there's the proposed section um, showing the changes, uh, the overall changes to the back, the rear and to the roof. So the um, we had submitted and worked with the landmark staff. Um, and there are two main items of consideration that we're here to discuss um, and, and seek your consideration on. One of them is the rear, uh, the removal of the rear bay window and the um, associated removal of the one story existing extension. And the second item is the work on the roof and the proposed uh, mechanical units and roof deck. So the first scope item is the bay window at the rear. Um, we've included photos in here. This is the existing condition. Um, the existing rear bay window is currently clad with vinyl. Um, it's clearly was done from prior to our clients purchasing the home. Um, as far as we can tell, there is no actual um, original or historic detail um, that we've been able to ascertain. Um, <clears throat> in the photo on the top, left, you'll see that there is a one-story extension on the side. We're also proposing to remove that. Um, unfortunately, um, the asbestos testing discovered that there is asbestos found at both the roof of the rear bay window, as well as at the roof of the extension. Um, and lastly, the third kind of item of consideration here is that um, we did conduct some probes on the exterior enclosure and discovered that um, it was not necessarily done to code. <laughs> there certainly isn't any insulation in there to speak of. Um, our proposal um, at the bottom, you'll see is the existing and proposed elevations. Um, so the proposal is to remove that pay window within the existing structural framing of that opening. Um, we're proposing a new uh, glazed um, window door system 
that opens onto a new metal deck and stair. Um, the photos at the top of this slide shows you the areas in red that we're proposing to remove. And you can see also that um, most of the lower two stories of our project is actually hidden completely by the existing two-story extension of 153 Underhill. Um, here's an example of what we're proposing that we did at a different project in the Bedford Historic District, um, and coincidentally also next to another two-story um, extension. So it's a very similar um, design being proposed. <laughs> the <clears throat> parlor level plan um, existing and proposed as shown um, indicates the one-story extension to be removed and the bay window to be removed. And then in the proposed plan, we're showing the new um, deck stairs and the new glazed opening. Um, one thing that I do want to emphasize um, here that's important to the clients is the, the use of the outdoor space, the backyard, and the connection uh, of circulation between indoor and out outdoor. And one of the reasons why it's become important here is that this lot is not a 90 foot lot because you're two in from the corner. Um, unlike many of the lots on Sterling and Park Place that are 123 feet long and the typical 100 foot Brooklyn lot, this one is 90. So um, the use of outdoor space and exterior access is uh, really critical for the client. And it's one of the reasons why we even decided to remove square footage by taking out that extension um, to maximize the use of the rear yard. Um, after some initial feedback um, from the LPC staff, we did uh, put together some 3D off the block or the donut as it's referred to. Um, we're noting in here that 159 um, has a rooftop terrace similar to what we're proposing, which will be the second part of this um, <clears throat> consideration. Um, at our building, um, you'll see that we are essentially um, sort of sandwiched in by an L shape um, of 153 that's parallel to us, and then 364 Park Place that's perpendicular to our lot. Um, the result of which is that um, the existing rear vin window is not visible from Park Place or, or from any public thoroughfare for that matter, and has incidental views um, mostly blocked by 364 Park Place from the um, neighborhood uh, backyards. We're also noting that two houses over at 161 Underhill, there is no bay window. Um, so the left photo in here uh, indicates that there's a, a fire escape. Um, so there isn't consistency on that uh, row of houses. And then on the right hand side, you'll see um, the second house in is 155, our project, um, which is pretty much um, the lower two floors are essentially obscured from view by the corner building. Um, we're also calling attention to the rooftop terrace that's two houses over. Um, with respect to this bay window removal, there is precedence for this. Um, one block over, um, one block to the north at 120 Underhill, um, which very similar to our project is also the second house in from the corner and therefore um, the rear facade is actually um, almost entirely obscured from view by the corner building. Um, We've included some screenshots in here. Um, this is from the public hearing in April, 2021. So there was recent precedence for the removal of that bay window in that instance um, and replacement. In, in this instance, proposal um, also included some um, actual enclosed extension space. We're not proposing to do any extension, um, but we are including this as an example of a precedence one block over where the bay window was removed given that it was all the way at the corner and not visible um, for, for the most part. Here are some more views from that um, public hearing presentation. Um, as part of that presentation, the, the precedence shown was 136 Underhill and 138 Underhill, um, which also do not have the rear uh, bay windows. And so we've included a photo in here of 136 um, as an example of more recent um, precedents for this removal. <clears throat> okay, so the second um, part of this um, that we're seeking your consideration on is the roof terrace or roof work. Um, we have the existing and proposed roof uh, plans in here. Um, what we're proposing on the roof um, is primarily composed of four parts and this axon metric 
um, diagram that you're seeing here, um, the cornice line that's at the top um, right corner is along Underhill. Um, the four parts of this scope of work that are being proposed. Um, one is the new mechanical units, um, uh, in particular the exterior outdoor condensers um, that will serve a new all electric heating and cooling system. Two is a daylighter hatch, which is a um, access from the stairs to the roof deck. Um, I should note that originally we had proposed a full height vertical bulkhead. Um, after that initial review, we decided that it was more appropriate to reduce that uh, profile and visibility by going with the daylight or hatch. Um, the third is the railing and um, the actual roof deck that it encloses um, that's associated with it, um, along with a gate that would be provided for a fire code um, for access. And the fourth is the uh, built into this is obviously the required six foot FDNY clearance that we're showing in the light pink. Um, we did, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we did run this um, through some initial feedback from um, both Landmarks and PHNDC. Um, the Landmarks Committee of Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development Committee, um, they had uh, suggested and asked that the, the railings be painted black. Um, we were happy to take that feedback. It aligned with uh, the feedback we also got from um, the staff level review. Um, we're showing two sections here through the roof terrace, one through the proposed new stair uh, daylight or hatch, the other um, through a more typical section at the roof. Um, one thing to note here is that the existing roof line is a little atypical um, in that the high point is about a third of the way in from the cornice line at Underhill. Um, so it kind of goes up and then back down again. Um, we've chosen to locate steel um, required for the steel for the deck, um, starting at that high point and then going back. Um, we've included in here examples of the kind of daylight or um, specification of that product. And then most importantly, um, we're showing that use um, at the roof terrace, two houses to the south and 159 on the hill. Um, so it's virtually the same product for the daylighter for the access to the roof. Um, and it is very similar to our proposal for the roof in that there is um, structural steel spanning party wall to party wall, um, similar to ours. Um, there is a roof deck, um, there is a railing with the stairs required for the FDNY access path and a gate um, that uh, curtails that access. Um, <clears throat> the reason we include this in here is because it's uh, obviously precedence for what we're proposing. Um, we've included in here photographs of the actual um, roof mock-up that was done, showing the outline of the daylighter hatch, the mechanical units and the high points of the railing. Um, so photos from the street, uh, on the, the left-hand side, the two photos at Underhill, um, from that close proximity on Underhill itself, um, the roof mock-up was not visible. On Park Place, um, just east of the intersection of uh, Park and Underhill, um, there are uh, views visible of the proposed new railing, um, which also um, notes the visibility of the railing at 159. So what we would be proposing would be something very similar to what's over there. Um, I'm including in here a photo that shows that the railing at our project 155 would be very similar in height and profile as the existing one at 159. And then <clears throat> lastly, some photos here are from the corner of Underhill in Park Place. So, um, at 153, um, because the cornice line is so high, it, it effectively blocks a lot of the view of our project, which is the second one in. Um, and then the building that's perpendicular to ours, 364 Park, has an existing black uh, metal railing along the edge, which was the point of reference for PHNDC asking us uh, to maintain a similar black uh, finish on the railing. There was concern on visibility of the mechanical condenser units um, along Park Place um, because we're the second house in. 
So there was concern of visibility both east on Park Place and then west on Park Place. Um, <clears throat> there is obvious, so we, we did a visibility study and looked at it in relation to the Cornus line. Um, obviously the closer you are, you can't actually see the, the mock-up, but then there is a point at which there is visibility off the units, the mechanical units in particular, the further back you go. And then as you continue further back from that, the, the visibility continues to drop um, <clears throat> from Park Place. We have in here photos from Park Place um, from the west. So this is on Park between Underhill and uh, Vanderbilt. Looking towards our site, you'll see in here that you can see some of the orange of the mock-up. Um, we've got five pages in here of photos um, where on the left and right, we're doing comparison between the photo of March 27th and then May 8th, um, um, just showing the difference in terms of uh, what happens with the, the springtime um, tree foliage, um, completely acknowledging and understanding that that's not considered a permanent obstruction to visibility. Um, and it, it does obviously vary based on the foliage. Um, nonetheless, uh, a lot of those views off the mechanical equipment would be mitigated, um, but not entirely eliminated. This is still west on Park Place, and then this is looking from the east on Park Place. So um, our house is the second one in from the corner. Um, again, a comparison photo between March and May. And then the final view here is um, showing that railing height, and then also showing that similar um, railing that we would hope to be matching to at 364 Park. Um, and that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your time Thank and you. consideration. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions on this application? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson, yes, please go ahead. Yes, one question. Um, in your particular donut, how many bay windows have been removed? Oh, sorry. Um, there are a few that have been removed. There was one, three houses over at 161, I believe. Um, it's not consistent. Oh, let me just go back. Uh, maybe the question is, how many don't know, how many bay windows are there and how many have been removed? Um, on In this donut. Um, in your donut, this particular. Yeah, 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 the one that's on the screen. Um, there is a sprinkling of them where they've been removed and there's a three-story extension, for example, at 370 Park. Um, and there's one that's been removed or was never there at 161 Underhill. So there are two? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, other uh, questions? Okay, let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you and I'll turn it over to Gregory to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, we had a few signups beforehand for this item, so we'll be hearing from them first. The first signup is Mary Shuford. So Mary Shuford, I will be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Mary Shuford. I'm co-chair of the Prospect Heights uh, Neighborhood Development Council Landmarks Committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this on 155 Underhill. The application, as you've heard, is to convert the building from a three-family to a two-family residence. No, no modifications to the front facade. The application is to remove the rear bay window, which has been modified from the original and place it, replace it with an eight foot deep by 18 foot eight inch wide deck accessed by a folding glass door system on the parlor level. Sliding glass doorway will be added on the basement level. Because of the deep extension at 153 Underhill Avenue, these modifications will not be visible from the public thoroughfare. The application also includes the installation of new mechanicals, a roof deck, and roof access via a day, uh, daylighter hatch. The proposed rooftop additions will not be visible from Underhill Avenue. However, the railing surrounding the roof deck will be partially visible from Park Place east uh, of Underhill. 
uh, the when we reviewed the plans, the applicant had been um, considering using a silver gray reflective finish similar to that at 159 under Hill Avenue. Um, and thank you for uh, accepting our recommendation that they use the same black finish as on the roof, uh, on the rooftop, as on the uh, extension on the rooftop extent railing. Uh, PHNDC does not usually support rooftop additions that are visible from a park, uh, public thoroughfare in the historic district. However, in this case, there is an existing rooftop deck at 159 Underhill Avenue that is visible from Park Place, as has been mentioned. The deck is cited as precedent by the applicant. Uh, PHNDC notes that it was approved through an amendment to a certificate of no effect, so had never been heard at an LPC hearing, nor reviewed by PHNDC. We request that LPC in the future ensure that when amendments are requested to existing permits that include work visible from public, a public thoroughfare, they instead be reviewed as COAs. Uh, thank you for considering our testimony. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please state your name for the record and unmute your line, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds the proposed removal of the bay window on this rear facade to be inappropriate as it is clearly a common architectural feature of this entire row. That said, we believe the bay window could be reinterpreted and that there may be precedent for adding a replicated bay window to the proposed rear extension, but the basic massing and bulk of the bay should be retained. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Jeremy Woodoff from Victorian Society of New York. So, Jeremy Woodoff, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, good afternoon again, Commissioners. Jeremy Woodoff for the Victorian Society in New York. The rooftop alterations, including the visible railing, are changes that would be minimally visible and not seen in context with the front of the building. We think this work is appropriate. However, we do not support removal of the oriel window at the rear of the building. All the houses in this long row and the adjacent row on Park Place appear to have been built with these orioles, and most remain. It's a significant original feature, and even though it has been reclad, we think its removal would be inappropriate and could set a dangerous precedent. We also think the proposed folding door opening is very untypical for rear facades and goes beyond even the kinds of alterations to parlor floor rear facades the commission typically finds appropriate. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And I'm looking through our attendees list now. I do not see any further hands raised. So I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 8 recommends approval. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'd like to turn back to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Yeah, sure. Um, I think just one comment on the massing of the, uh, the, the comment about the massing with the bay window. We did look at uh, different ways in which to sort of retain that geometric massing. Um, one of the um, constraints that that forces then is it makes the deck um, that we're proposing to do very um, <clears throat> unusable in a sense, because the proposed deck would be um, eight feet from the face of the building and with a, a bay window massing that projects out about three or four feet, that leaves a very awkward space um, that isn't actually feasible or usable. Um, the second part of that, um, I would say, is that we, we understand the um, relevance to a lot of people in the neighborhood off the bay window. Um, we did consider the fact here, though, that um, this is at the end of the block. Um, it's all the way in the corner. It's shielded from view, essentially, by 153 Underhill. Um, so, and by 364 Park Place, um, a result of which is that it's not only just on a secondary non-visible facade, it's also um, almost invisible or almost 
very less visible, I should say, sorry, um, from the backyards of the, the block. Thanks. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? Yes, Commissioner Ginsburg. Uh, I just wanted to ask, with the new mechanical equipment, are you getting rid of fossil fuels as part of this project? Yeah, this is a, this is a con these are condensers for a heat pump system, so it's an all-electric heating and a cooling system. So there's no, no gas. Thank you. Okay, and then just one final comment, a question on the bay window. I know you did some probes, and so under the vinyl siding is some modern plywood, and is that all that's there? Yeah, unfortunately, we did not find any um, sort of historic fabric or any kind of detail. Um, the building is currently occupied. It is um, tenant occupied. So <laughs> there's only so much um, we can strip yeah. away of an exterior enclosure in an occupied building. Okay. All right, so thank you. And commissioner, oh yes, Commissioner Lutfi, please go ahead. So just uh, to speak to the that particular point and the bay window in general, I mean, if you go to page 16 the, and look at the, the donut, I mean, it's predominantly bay windows. So I could, uh, I mean, I could appreciate, I, or I can appreciate the fact that it may have been altered, but wouldn't the goal be to, I mean, and I, I'm actually speaking, you know, in terms of the commission, wouldn't, wouldn't the goal be to Re, you know, maintain the integrity of the donut as opposed to, as Fred would say, just on a slippery slope where we say this. Yes, I mean, Luffy, that is the question before you. So that is what you'll be evaluating and commenting on. And we have on uh, this block or other blocks on Underhill Avenue already approved the removal of altered bays in rows where there were other bays. And I think that um, in terms of the slippery slope question, I, one could, you can evaluate each building kind of on its own merit and um, make a very site specific observation or finding that wouldn't necessarily apply to everyone else, right? So we do that a lot. If there's a rooftop addition that is, um, minimally visible from the public thoroughfare and then one building over wants to do the same size rooftop addition. Sometimes we find that because of its location in the block, it's more visible in a way that detracts. And so we have not allowed someone to have the same addition as one that we've approved further in the block because it's, the, site, the findings were very site specific and don't set a precedent for each of the houses. So. You know, I think that's the other comment Fred makes is none of our actions that are really um, set. They do set precedent, but they also are handled on a case by case individual basis. So I think that's one way to think about the Bay. And that's how we have thought about them on other blocks on Underhill where we've approved the removal. Um, other factors also consider visibility from the street and historic fabric and level of alterations. Um, but one might decide that this row, regardless of how visible it is from within the block or from the street, um, has such a strong presence of them. And if they were at least in their form still intact and had that relationship um, that you see in this diagram, if they actually sort of still have that reading in real life as well with all of their alterations, one could decide that it's not appropriate to remove it. So I think that's the question before you and that's what we'll be getting at. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, Commissioner Chu. Yeah, a quick question. Um, if the applicant could explain, is there uh, challenges or, or could the deck get extended more? The proposed deck? Um, yeah. <clears throat> the current regulations require a deck to project no more than eight feet from the face of the facade. 
So okay, which if is... you took yeah, if you took that bay window profile and overlaid it on okay. the deck that's below, what you essentially end up with is is a zone that's very awkward um, as an exterior space. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other final questions? Hmm. Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. Just make a uh, unmute, yeah. So Commissioner Jefferson, if you're speaking, you're on mute. You need to unmute. Wait, Commissioner Jefferson, you're muted and we can't hear you. No, oh, there's something wrong with there mine. You. Well, go back to the, <laughs> the image you had before, the previous image, where you had the extension. No, the, move one, one, okay. The extension you have is more than eight feet, right? The, you mean the, 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 the extension on the top is more than eight feet. Sorry, it's to, existing to, now is to, more than eight feet. No, but that is correct. But to clarify, a new proposed deck, um, an outdoor deck that's unenclosed, um, a new would, a, a new surface can only be eight feet. That can be right. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Other questions. Okay, so let's move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we're going to begin our discussion and there are two components. One is at the rooftop where there is a skylight mechanical equipment, a deck and railings that are uh, being proposed and um, most of which is not visible over the public, uh, over the front facade, excuse me. Um, the deck is, um, deck railings are uh, visible. Um, but seen in the context of other railings and other visible railings in the district. And then the second component of the application is to remove the existing rear extension and the bay window and to uh, just install a larger masonry opening with a deck in front of it. And we've had a lot of discussion about the bay window. It is in a block, and I don't know if there are photos that can show um, the the others, uh, other bay windows in this row, but that might help in the discussion. Um, the bay in itself, as we've seen, has been altered and has uh, layers of non-historic fabric, is not visible from a public way, and is at the end of the row and not is visible from within the block. Um, I think that the, uh, that only I think the applicant stated only two have been removed in this block. So that is another factor for consideration. And so we'll begin our discussion now on the removal of the bay window and the rooftop mechanical work. So um, Commissioner Ginsburg, would you like to start this one? Okay. Uh, I think the rooftop is fine. The applicant may need to add more railings at the near the rear edge line, but in, uh, I don't see an issue with that. I really feel like the the part of the history of this block of the bay windows, and that there, first of all, if the deck can be eight feet from the facade, it can extend out farther where there's a bay, because I'm presuming it can be eight feet from the bay, and that I would be fine with keeping the bay restoring it, but instead of three windows, having three large door openings to open up to the bay so that they could get, I, I, I understand they want to connect the interior and exterior. So I, I would say, I, I would vote to keep the bay, but allow for, first of all, restoration and removal of the vinyl siding, but also with flexibility and how they put openings into the bay. Okay, great, thank you.
Commissioner Lutfi? Um, I'm in agreement with uh, Commissioner Ginsburg. I think the roof is fine, um, but I do feel like this is donut is remarkably intact. And um, so I would have to say that uh, I could be flexible about in restoring it, you know, having multiple openings and creating a deck as is appropriate according to uh, code. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. <laughs> Oh, um, okay. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, um, the rooftop units are fine. I think the um, visibility is minimal. And I think they can use creative, creative thinking to come up with a bay window made out of glass or something that doesn't eliminate the bay window, but represented in a different form but I, I don't think they should remove it. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Commissioner Chu? Yes, um, I agree that the rooftop proposal is okay. My only comment to the applicant, and this is just something to think about, is like, look at that stair going down to the back of the facade and it just worries me and I wanted you to look at rotating at 90 degrees because it just seems like an accident waiting to happen unless you end up with a big rail at the back, which I have to say is not very attractive to put that right on the back facade, that railing that we saw also on the pre-existing condition of another building. The exterior rear massing, I think, should be retained because of the completeness of this donut. And I, I guess the, my words are massing, so you have room to interpret it. And if you can extend the deck that eight feet, if that includes the footprint of the floor you're on, I don't think there's a conflict there. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Master? Yes, I agree with all of the other commissioners' comments um, and I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen? Yeah, no disagreement here. Okay. All right. So I think what we'll do today is we'll take no action. Um, we have gotten some really good, helpful comments from the commissioners, uh, both about uh, the roof, um, which I think for the most part is conceptually fine, but there was some suggestion about thinking about that uh, stair and then the railing. And then um, again, most of the comments really focused on the bay. And I think there is some flexibility to how you engage the exterior from the interior, but that the form of the bay should be maintained because it is so predominant in this particular block. Um, but we will keep it open to let you design something that um, is that works with a bay and meets your family's needs and uh, achieves that connection between the interior and exterior. And when you're ready, we'll have you back as soon as we can. All right, thank you very much. So that will conclude our day today. It's a very long day and I wanna thank you all for your hard work and long hours and commitment today. It really, it was a, a power day and really do appreciate it. And we will see everybody next week on June 13th.